Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me formally welcome uh, uh, Professor Harsh Pant sir, Professor Swan Singh sir, uh, Ambassador Anil Trigunath sir, and uh, Professor K J Prashad sir, Ambu Shamburam sir, uh, Ambassador Dr. Shamburam sir, and our our uh, our uh, great leader Professor Dr. Gurinder Singh sir. Uh, most welcome for this uh, technical come valid session. Um, now I'll uh, hand over to the anchor who will uh, take forward the session. Thank Most you. welcome, sir. I'm highly obliged for each one of you that you have taken time for the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, could you please confirm if I'm audible and visible? Yes, you are audible, but not visible, dear. Ma'am, am I visible now? Not yet. Maybe it takes time. It's okay. Okay. Uh, you are not visible, dear. I think you can go ahead. It's okay. Yes, ma'am. Because to me, I am visible on the screen. That's why. Uh, but not yet visible. Yeah. Also not audible, Lakshmi. Mm. My audible now? Yes. Yeah, a little bit. Yes. Okay, okay. Esteemed dignitaries, esteemed dignitaries, presenters, and scholars, those who've joined us through Zoom and those watching us live on Facebook, a very good evening to one and all. I, Lakshmi at Sajeev, on behalf of Amity Institute of International Studies, welcome you all to the panel discussion come validatory session of Vijigishu 2020. We've had wonderful deliberations and paper presentations over the past two days on issues concerning the South Asian region. Now to carry forward the spirit of Vijigishu 2020, we move into a panel discussion on the theme, Reimagining South Asia Multilateralism in the Post-COVID World. Now I would like to introduce the panelists for the session. Joining us, we have Professor Harsh Vipant, Professor, International Relations in Defence Studies Department and India Institute, King's College, London. Professor Swaran Singh, sir, Chairperson, Centre for International Politics, Organisation and Disarmament, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, sir, Member of Indian Foreign Service, Distinguished Fellow, VIF, India. Professor Dr. K. Jay Prasad, Pro Vice Chancellor, Central University of Kerala. Ambassador Dr. Shamburam Simkada, National Defense University, Nepal. I hereby welcome all the panelists for this session. Now I hand over the mic to Dr. Jaydev Parida, sir, to formally introduce and welcome our panelists. Dr. Jaydev Parida is an associate professor at Amity Institute of International Studies. He has done his PhD in cybersecurity from Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has also worked as a research fellow with Observer Research Foundation, where he worked on cybersecurity and internet governance. Also, he was a research assistant with the National Foundation for Research and Security, where he worked on India's national security. Um, he continues to uh, take on his technological endeavor in our department, where he spearheads the Politics of Technology Club engaging club members in informative discussions. He also finds keen interest in geopolitics and new power engagements in IR. Without much delay, I now hand over the mic to Dr. Jaydev Parida, sir. Dr. Jaydev Parida, could you please take over? Thank yeah, you. Uh, Thank you so much, Lakshmi. Uh, please uh, form uh, formally welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Gurinder Singh, sir. He is the Group Vice Chancellor of Amity Universities. Right. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, it's very warm. Good evening to all those are here or watching us on Facebook or MS team. Uh, it's my pleasure to have with us our dynamic leader, our head, Professor Dr. Nagalakshmi M. Raman, ma'am. And it's also it's uh, my privilege to welcome our guest of honor, uh, Professor Gurinder Singh, sir. Sir, has, uh, sir is the group vice chancellor. Amity Universities. He's also Director General, Amity Group of Institutions, and Vice Chairman, 
Global Foundation for Learning Excellence, and Director General Anmiti International Business School. He has extensive experience of more than 25, 26 years in institutional building, teaching, consultancy, research, and industry. Professor Singh is a renowned scholar in academia in the area of international business. He holds a prestigious doctorate in the area along with a postgraduate degree from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, which is also a very prestigious institute. Sir also holds a distinct a distinction of being the youngest founder of uh, pro vice chancellor of Amity University for two terms, the founder director general of Amity International Business School and the founder CEO of Association of International Business School, London. He has been instrumental in establishing various Amity campuses abroad, including at London, US, Singapore, Mauritius, Tashkent, and other parts of the world. He has spoken at various international forums most of the Ivy League universities and uh, in Southeast Asia and Europe and America. Apart from that, Sir is internationally recognized for his uh, work in academics. Sir is a well-known professor in the area of management and institution building. Sir is a voracious reader and Sir is a distinguished academician uh, as a top class trainer and Sir is an international business expert and champion of the students in Amity universe. And also Sir is a dynamic personality in, in Amity. We believe in punctuality. If you're looking at Amity, you look at punctuality, you look at Sir, the way Sir uh, carry forward Amity and Amity values and ethos outside the world. So without much delay, I'd like to invite Sir to give us blessings and give us words of wisdom so that AIS as institute should grow much, much longer. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jadev. A very warm welcome to all the participants on behalf of our very honorable and respected uh, founder president, Dr. Ashok K. Chohan, and on behalf of our honorable chancellor, Dr. Atul Chohan. Both of them, they are uh, uh, watching this valedictory function live on their behalf and on behalf of all the vice chancellors, all the deans, directors, 175,000 uh, family members of MAD, very warm welcome to each one of you. We are really privileged. We are really privileged that we have got the presence of Ambassador Anil. Very warm welcome, Ambassador Anil. Uh, we have got a presence of Ambassador Professor Dr. Shambhuram. We are really honored by your, your presence. Uh, Professor uh, Harsh Pant, uh, on whom we feel so proud that he is representing King's College London, Professor Suren Singh from JNU, Professor uh, K. Uh, Jayabrath uh, from Kerala, uh, our own very dynamic, vibrant uh, uh, professor and director, uh, Professor Naga Lakshmi, who has been the instrumental force of organizing this mega event, uh, uh, Professor Jotsna, uh, my own very distinguished senior colleague, uh, Lieutenant General Gadeo. Uh, all vice chancellors, deans, uh, uh, representatives of media, and uh, I think most important, uh, very dear students. It was a dream of our founder, Dr. Chohan, that MIT should be able to create something which is different. And during COVID-19, when we spoke to, to the students, all of them, they were looking very worried. And I think that we got thousands of questions that what is going to happen, where they will get placements, how we are going to deliver programs. And we spoke to our directors, our very dedicated professionals like Dr. Nagalakshmi, who said and who assured that we will be able to give world-class exposure to our students. Dear students, it's very, very important that along with your classroom studies, you must interact with the industry you must interact with the honorable ambassadors. You must interact with the international bodies like NICE, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, who has been so very kind to come along with MIT to, to be a part of this event. Because more you will interact with the international organizations, you will be actually be able to understand what is happening internationally. And I was going through the deliberations of uh, the honorable speakers who were speaking on South Asia, what was speaking on East Asia. There was a session on the Indo-Pacific region. It, there was a session on Indo-Ocean region. Uh, I think that the, the kind of papers, research work, and the speakers who spoke 
uh, it was a full master's program. So you're very lucky. You're really lucky that you are in a university and you have got a support and blessings of such senior people who have taken time out of their very busy schedule. So first of all, on behalf of MIT family, we thank each one of you. I think that calling to learned ambassadors and calling people like Dr. Uh, Dr. Shambhu, Dr. Harshwan, uh, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Swaran, Dr. Jabra, I think it's not, not at all on easy tasks. So my congratulations to you, Dr. Nagalakshmi, that you have been able to do that. But when I speak to the students, I'm really cautious and I'm really worried when I speak to them because most of them, they have questions for us. They have questions for us because they feel that they are under tremendous pressure. They don't know that what, are, what is going to be their fate once they, they finish their program. I was talking to, to a few of our foreign partners. As you know, that MIT has got 15 foreign campuses and we have got 11 universities. And whenever we speak to the students from Afghanistan, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives, and few students from Pakistan who are also doing our online programs, we feel that there is a lot of synergy, a lot of things we can do in the South Asia region, which is the topic for the, for the uh, valedictory session. It's very, very important that we should answer the challenges which COVID-19 is, is, is throwing on all of us. I remember Dr. Chauhan, who's our founder, coming out and helping thousands of African students. And those were the days when our honorable president, Dr. Kalam, for the first time when he went to, the, to Africa, uh, and he spoke, I remember because we were the part of the delegation. And he said that I want to give a gift to Africa. And everyone clapped. And the, message, I mean, the next thing which he said was that, but not a dollar to give. So everyone was thinking that what uh, the president of India is going to give them. What is this international gift which is coming? But honorable ambassadors and honorable speakers will tell you that such a visionary are honorable President was, he said that I'm going to give you a gift of knowledge. And those were the days when there was no internet. And he, at that time, requested, appealed, European Union, that why don't you come forward and become a part of the project called Pan African E Network Project, which was the project of uh, Ministry of External Affairs. European Union said it is too difficult a project. We will not be able to implement it. Honorable President came back. And he invited all top rated universities, IITs, and he said that this needs to be done. 19 universities, dear students, 19. 18 said it is not possible. And it was the commitment of our founder, Dr. Chauhan. He said that this needs to happen because India needs to contribute. India needs to ensure that Africa gets the knowledge. And you will not believe it that with the blessings of so many ambassadors who are present here, Ministry of External Affairs and MIT University, they came together and we were able to educate more than 40,000 Africans. Our sisters and brothers, free of cost. And today, when we talk about South Asia, a similar challenge has come in front of us. Medicines, hospitals, how to meet the challenges. And when Honorable Prime Minister spoke, he said that in spite of whatever differences we may have, in spite of whatever resources we may have, I think the South Asian countries, they have to come together and face this challenge. On behalf of our founder and chancellor, I am committing that we want to take another step. And that step is that we should be able to do something in the area of higher education and educating students. COVID-19 should not be able to defeat the spirit of providing world-class education. And I think that every Indian university, and especially MIT, is taking many steps. We have been able to provide an online platform. We have created MIT Future Academy, in which more than 100,000 students across the world in the last five months have taken three programs. We have been able to do a collaboration with more than 300 foreign universities. Almost every Ivy, Ivy League is a part of that initiative. Almost all the Russell Group of universities are a part of it. And we are so happy that we have got a representative of King's College, which is also a partner in this initiative. 1,000 strong advisory board we have been able to make in the last six months. 500 people from the academic world, 500 from the industry world. To, to ensure that the students who are on, on the seminar, the students who are in Afghanistan, who are in Bangladesh, who are in Sri Lanka, who are in Nepal, who are in Bhutan, who are in Maldives, 
or who are part of our 15 universities worldwide, they should get the world-class education and world-class opportunities working in some of the leading organizations. And I think this is the biggest service. This is what the challenge is when the students of these countries, when the students of India, when the youngsters, they are asking that what is going to be their fate. Next year, they are graduating. Some have graduated this year. Where they will be working? MIT has taken a step forward. We have taken a step forward to ensure that all those who have got worries, we should be the answer to their worries. COVID-19 may have given difficult situation, but I'm sure that all of you are going to defeat COVID-19. With these words, once again, very warm welcome in the valedictory event. It's a wonderful event, and I can see a number of our very senior colleagues, and I can see Dr. Pachuk also. Thank you so very much. But students, believe me, MIT is for you. Don't feel, don't feel stressed. We are here to bring the smiles on your face. When we speak to youngsters and when the youngsters feel stressed, it really pains us. We want that each one of you should get a wonderful career. And we will ensure that till we breathe our last, we should be able to provide you not only employment, but wonderful career. With good wishes, with thanks, and with my compliments to Dr. Naga Lakshmi for organizing such a wonderful event. Once again, thank you so much, our very distinguished speakers who have been able to take time out of the busy schedule. Thank you so very much. MIT really uh, 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 feels a lot and thanks you, th th thank you for giving your time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It's really fascinating. Now uh, it's my time to uh, welcome the panelists. So it, it, there is a say that keep the best oh, for the last. Go. Right. Uh, so we now we kept the best of our entire three days discussion for the last, that is the valedictory session, followed by a panel discussion. Right. And in this panel, we have eminent speaker, both from India and outside, who was both uh, academic policy and real world experience. So they are diplomats, they are uh, our professors, right? So first I would like to welcome Professor uh, Dr. Hurst V. Pant. Sir, uh, he's a professor of international relations in defense studies department and India's Institute at King's College London. Sir also a diacel, sir is also serving as director studies and head of strategic studies program of our Chavarich's Research Foundation, ORF that we know. And sir also, having an uh, honorary director of Delhi School of Transnational Affairs at Delhi University. Sir also writes regularly at various platforms, international journals uh, and news item, newspapers, uh, reputed newspapers, and also appear in TV and news platforms. And also it's, privilege, it's, it's a, privilege, a privilege to have Professor Pons over here because when I was there in ORF, Sir's door is always open for the young researcher like me and others to come and discuss and deliberate uh, regarding uh, the policy planning or issues related to strategic defense. Sir, so it's an honor to have you here. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Professor Dr. Soren Singh, sir. Sir is the chairperson for CPOD, the jewel of uh, uh, SIS JNU, that, that particular department. It stands as Center for International Politics, Organization and Disarmament. Even it was my dream to join that particular institute. And when I came there, sir was in the chairperson and sir was interviewing me, although I was not joined, I was selected in European studies. And apart from that, sir is, uh, sir is, having, sir is president of Association of a ASIA Scholars. Sir is general secretary of Indian Association of Asian and Pacific Studies. Sir is having multiple guest appearance, both uh, national and international universities. Sir, Borat, sir is, uh, sir is outstanding writers in, in, in China, Indochina affairs, cyber affairs. Sir is also having in relations with uh, renowned think tanks and policy works. Sir is also part of various uh, uh, boards. Those are based in China, United States of America and here. And Professor Singh also having 25, more than 25 years of research experience. And Sir also is one of the renowned speaker in national defense college and defense service staff. Apart from that, sir has 18 PhD uh, scholars and more than 37 MPhil scholars on, her, on his credit. 
Apart from that, Sar also writes various research papers, news items. Like each day morning, we used to get one Facebook post from Soren Singh Sir that there is some things happening in India, China, or somewhere else. So it's it's an honor and privilege to have you, sir, over here. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Anil Trigunayak. Sir is a former Indian Foreign Service. Currently, he is a distinguished fellow in VIF, was a renowned uh, think tank in India, who steered in India's foreign policy and strategic affairs. Sir also served as an Indian mission to Bangladesh, Mongolia, US, Russia, Sweden, Nigeria, Libya, and Jordan. Sir also having various portfolios in Ministry of External Affairs and other, uh, in Ministry of External Affairs and other councils in India. And sir also served as Deputy Chief of Mission in, in the rank of Ambassador to Embassy India in Mos Moscow. And sir also having various other uh, portfolios, uh, which is, uh, which is very, uh, it's very vast in to cover in very, in, in two to three minutes. Apart from that, sir, also having various association with uh, big universities like Oxford, Cambridge, and also, sir, is part of Association of Indian Diplomats. Thank you, sir. It's an honor and privilege to have you, sir. And the next panelist that we have, Professor Dr. K. Jay Prasad. Sir was former co-vice chancellor of Central University of Kerala. Uh, professor uh, Professor Jay Prasad uh, currently is a professor and head of the Department of International Relations at Central University of Kerala. He's he is a member executive council Central University of Kerala. He's also uh, served, served as a dean school of cultural studies and director of Mahatma Al Avyakali Center for Kerala Studies. He is the editor of uh, the research journal called Pragati and also associate editor of South Asian journal of South Asia Journal Socio Political Studies. Sir, so it's an honor and privilege to have you, sir, in the panel discussion. Next, we have uh, our foreign delegates, the Ambassador Dr. Samburam Sikhan. Uh, sir, is National Defense University in Nepal. He's a former permanent representative to UN and former ambassador. Sir is a visiting faculty. Uh, and he's also having various interest in uh, contemporary diplomacy, conflict resolution, uh, developmental issues, and, and various other issues related to Nepal and its position in international affairs. Sir uh, is part of also human rights commissions. He was also part of World Trade Organization, other international organizations that are based in Geneva and outside. And Sir has very keen interest in social welfare and academic field. It is our honor and privilege to have you, sir. And with this small introduction, I will now I'd like to hand over this panel discussion to none other than our professor, Dr. Hush Panser. Sir, over to you, sir, for and enlighten us and make a conclusive outcome of this three day event. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parida, and thank you, uh, the organizers, for making me part of this discussion. Uh, it's, um, it's always great uh, to be able to talk to an audience as large as this in this virtual environment uh, that we don't get to see a lot of people. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to be, to be talking and to be part of this very distinguished panel of speakers. I, uh, you know, I, I First of all, I think I would like to begin with just uh, echoing the sentiments that were earlier expressed by the group chairman, uh, how important it is uh, to have greater knowledge interaction among South Asian countries. Uh, I think one uh, aspect which is perhaps uh, central to our South Asian predicament is that uh, the, you know, despite our historical legacies of being great citadels of knowledge and wisdom, we have not been able to translate into the modern world in terms of our institutions of learning. We are still struggling across countries, across, uh, you know, uh, in this geography, uh, where uh, you know, quality education is something that we are struggling to come to terms with. Uh, and therefore, we have to look outside South Asia, we have to look at other stakeholders to, to bring that education to the country. Uh, and I think in that, uh, given how, uh, you know, given the population density of South Asia, I think it would be uh, and given that that knowledge is going to determine the balance of power in the coming uh, you know, decades, uh, it's imperative that we get the knowledge equation right in South Asia. And I and I and I hope that conversations like this allow us to um, to make uh, that case more importantly to not only to students 
um, but also to policymakers. I, and I think students, the more they interact with a cross section of uh, South Asian population, irrespective of you know uh, where they come from, uh, it allows that that uh, that knowledge productivity to be enhanced, and that allows us to look at the world differently, perhaps uh, than we are used to. Uh, but I would uh, you know uh, whenever you say so, the topic is reimagining uh, South Asia and. Um, how do you think of multilateralism in the post-COVID world? Now, whenever you talk of multilateralism in South Asia, uh, you know there is a sense of uh, you know if if you talk if you talk about this to a room full of people, you would you would you would immediately find half of them would leave the room, half of them would start yawning, uh, half of them would struggle to come to terms with the reality that what are we talking about? You know, multilateralism, South Asia, uh, done to death, similar issues, India, Pakistan, not allowing multilateralism to do anything, then SARC is not working, so much despondency, so much pessimism bound. And I think I, I want to, uh, you know, in, in my brief comments, I want to, uh, you know, shake the, those, uh, those assumptions a bit because uh, I think what has happened and what is happening today in the, in, 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 in the way, uh, and I think the title is very apt, Reimagining South Asia, I think the way South Asia is being reimagined, uh, especially by New Delhi, opens up a lot of possibilities um, of, of discarding the old paradigm and of looking at South Asia, of looking at multilateralism in South Asia through a new light. Uh, and those of us who are studying it, I think we, we need to start asking different set of questions rather than the similar old set of questions where 100, 100 PhDs on why SARC doesn't work. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, and the 100 PhDs, 101 first PhD is not going to help us in deciphering why South SARC doesn't work. So I think the question, therefore, we need to start asking is from a different vantage point, is, is, is what are the sources of change in South Asia and whether those sources of change would engender uh, a, a, you know, a shift in the policy landscape. Uh, and I think those, those questions are not being asked, unfortunately, in the academic domain. A lot, a lot of what is happening in the realm of South Asia's reimagination uh, is all only happening in the policy world. And that from the policy to the academia, the transfer has not happened yet. There is another dimension to this problem, which I want to highlight is that often, you know, every few, every few months you would hear uh, and you would read in newspapers, uh, heavens are falling, India is losing South Asia, South Asia is going to the dogs, India has no place there, China is coming in, this and that. And this is a, this is a, this is cyclical. Every you know every few months the cycle gets repeated. Someone gets elected in one of the South Asian neighbors. You say, oh, China has won. Someone gets another candidate gets elected. India has won. You know, as if this is a game of chess. As if the smaller states don't have any agency. Uh, so I think this also this paradigm of of the journalistic approach to South Asia, which is here and now. That let's look at South, who is who is contesting and what is that person, what does that person uh, has said, how many times that person, how many times that person has traveled to uh, China compared to how many times he has traveled to India, that tells you, I mean, all of those questions may have some relevance, but I think in the longer trajectory of the scholarship on the region, they often confuse more than, uh, more than clarify. So we have to be a bit attuned to the larger issue here. What are the larger underpinnings of South Asia uh, today? And how do we define South Asia? What, does, what do we mean by South Asia? Is South Asia simply the construct of, uh, you know, members of, this, of SARC, the traditional members of SARC? Or is, this, is, this, is there a way of looking at South Asia differently? Now, historically, we know what has happened. Historically, we know that, uh, you know, Pakistan issue has sapped India's energies. India-Pakistan discourse has sapped the energy of entire South Asian region. So beyond India, Pakistan, nothing else was being discussed. Whenever it, it used to be a um, you know, South Asian landscape, the first thing that would come to mind to any, any outside interlocutor, and even someone you know, sitting in a foreign university looking at the multilateralism, regionalism in South Asia, the first thing that person, that scholar, that policymaker would pick up would be India-Pakistan dynamic. How that India-Pakistan dynamic is you know, fraying, how that is not allowing multilateralism to work, regionalism to work, et cetera, et cetera. And so India itself diplomatically has also struggled with that legacy. And that's, that's very clear from, from the results that we have not been able to, uh, you know, revamp or come out of that, of that constraint. And that has imposed enormous costs on Indian foreign policy, Indian security policy, India's ability to move beyond South Asia. So, uh, you know, in a sense, this idea that, that India, Pakistan, this co-branding of India and Pakistan this idea that South Asia always has to be looked at, looked at through the prism of India and Pakistan, uh, you know, 
partly because of India, partly because of Pakistan, and partly because of external interlocutors not being able to challenge some of that, some of those assumptions, made it you know made it very difficult to reconceptualize South Asia, reconcept, reconceptualize regionalism in South Asia, and reconceptualize multilateralism in South Asia. So I think you know what we need to then get to is uh, what is the new reality staring us today from the Himalayan borders to our neighbors, if you look around today, the new reality is that there is actually no Pakistan problem. There is a China problem. And Pakistan problem is by and large a subset of your China problem. So if you are looking at South Asia predominantly through the lens of India, Pakistan, then you are going to reach conclusions which are more often than not going to be fallacious. They are going to be wrong. Because the fallacy inherent in that would be that it's the India-Pakistan dynamic that is driving South Asia, that is driving conceptualizations about South Asia, that is driving multilateralism in South Asia, debates on multilateralism. But the reality is much, very, very different. The reality is that it is, it is today about India and China, that India has left Pakistan far behind. Pakistan may not like it, but that's the reality. When you have an economy that is smaller than the economy of Mumbai, then the issue for Pakistan to consider is that it can be a nuisance value for India, but it can't be of strategic uh, importance for India. So what Pakistan can today do is to create problems for India by or in alliance with China. So the real problem is China. The real issue today to talk about in terms of South Asian landscape is China. And I'm sure in your, two, you know, in, in your discussions over the last two days, China would have been the big elephant in the room. Every, every conversation would have veered around China. But, and that is also the reality in South Asia. South Asian context today cannot be looked at primarily through the India-Pakistan prism that used to be the mantra of South Asianists uh, during, uh, you know, over the last um, six decades almost. I think that the transformation has been uh, swift. The transformation has been not only because of China's rise, and China's rise is very important, but also because of rising India, but also because of Indian aspirations rising. India wanting to play a major role beyond South Asia. If you look at the Indian trajectory of the last two decades, India has tried its best to get rid of the Pakistan cloak, uh, Pakistan uh, weight on its shoulders. And that means that as India tried to get out of the, of the South Asian prism, South Asian constraint, uh, China recognizing the reality that India can possibly do this has doubled down on, on, on India. So a lot of the problems about China not allowing the discussion, uh, for example, not allowing India entry into, an, into the NSG, China not allowing discussion on terrorism, China not allowing uh, India to enter into UN Security Council, are a tribute as much, uh, are a function as much of China's uh, rise as they are a function of India's rise. So I think that is also, that, that, you know, that is an area also that one should examine, that it is not simply India's weakness that is a problem. It is not simply that India is not able to, you know, often the discussion is that, oh, India does not have enough resources. India does not have enough uh, deep pockets. Yes, that's true. India does not have enough resources when you compare it to China. But the, the issue here is also that it is India's relative rise in the last two decades that has also ensured that China's claws are getting sharpened, that China is looking at the region differently and looking at India's rise differently and therefore is doubling down on India, on India, and uh, in, in shaping the constraints around India. So that is a reality that that is not often talked about, but that is a reality that I think, as students, as scholars of Indian foreign policy of South Asia, we need to consider how uh, dynamically the region is is changing and how dynamic that change is inherent in that process of India and China, both rising, both jostling with each other, whether it in the Himalayan borders, whether it is the maritime space, and whether it is in South Asian periphery of India. So that is, you know, that is that is one aspect. The other aspect is, of course, that you know, successive administrations. It can be, um, you know, um, Narasimha Rao government. It can be Atal Bihari Vajpayee government. It can be, um, you know, governments uh, that Manmohan Singh government. It can be Modi government. It goes without saying that uh, neighborhood will always come first. For any country, neighborhood is always first. So whether Mr. Modi says neighborhood first or whether it was. Um, uh, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's focus on, on, on the neighbor and trying to resolve disputes with Pakistan and, and, and uh, you know, in an attempt to, um, to sort of make India free of the South Asian constraint. That's a reality that, that the region and, and Indian foreign policy has been grappling with and all successive governments have, 
uh, try to uh, shape that in accordance with their own priorities. But what is the change? And there is a significant change in the last five, six, six, six years if you, if you assess the regional geopolitics. The shift is that after an initial outreach to Pakistan, the assumption and the, you know, that, it, it, the, the, that that outreach did not work meant that India had to recalibrate its assessment of what it can and cannot do in the region. Rather, so the assessment was that rather than trying to break your head against a Pakistani wall that refuses to give in, let's ignore Pakistan. Let's move from SARC to BIMSTEC. You know, this is this transformation in terms of thinking that institutionalization needs to be looked at differently. That SARC is one medium of regional institutionalization. SARC is one medium of regional multilateralism. But if you make it the only medium, you are not only putting pressure, too much pressure on the medium itself, on, on SARC itself, but you are also preventing your own priorities into getting transformed into something more substantive. So you can, you, need, you can continuously keep on saying that, look, we want, to, we want to revive SARC. SARC is very important. Perhaps it is. But if SARC is not working, then the question for India is that can it just sit back and say, let, let us not do anything? Or should we start using uh, alternative avenues that are available to India? And I think that is, that is what the shift has been, that the argument became that let's ignore Pakistan because in any case, bilateral negotiations will not happen till terror stops. So we, we now shift the focus from the West to the East, which does two things. It, A, it, re, it allows India to reimagine South Asia. That South Asia is not simply the, mem, uh, it does not simply constitute of member states of SARC. For India, India's immediate neighborhood is also Myanmar and Thailand, countries with which India has had historical connections, historical linkages. We don't talk about them in, 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 the, in the discourse on South Asia itself because they are not seen as part of quote unquote South Asia. But for India, they are India's immediate partners and they have been historically. So to not to put them or not to bring them in into India's uh, immediate neighborhood uh, uh, framework does grave injustice to India's role in the region as well as to their bilateral relations with these countries. But so A, it allows India to reimagine South Asia by bringing in countries which are traditionally considered to be Southeast Asian. But it also opens the way for India into Southeast Asia and East Asia. So you are looking at, you know, you are looking at an arrangement that allows India a seamless entry into South, Southeast Asia, uh, a, a region which typically India is seen as an outsider to. So in, in some ways, if you reimagine South Asia differently, if you fo start focusing on the Bay of Bengal uh, frame of reference, you do a couple of things with your foreign policy. You make it, that, that becomes a more proactive way of engaging uh, with, this, with this question of what India can potentially do in South Asia. If there are challenges with Pakistan, then that, that, you know, that those challenge in and of themselves cannot become the focal point of India's engagement in South Asia. We, we have other neighbors, we need to bring them on board, we need to work with them, uh, and those neighbors uh, will have to be engaged with the you know, in, in a more substantive framework. So if you want to move from SARC to BIMSTEC, there is an arc there, there is a trajectory there that is available, there is, there is an institutional mechanism there that is available, and that institutional mechanism allows you certain leeway into framing your foreign policy in much different ways than you know, consistently talking only of Pakistan and consistently lamenting the fact that nothing much is happening in South Asia. And I think that optimism should give way, to, uh, that pessimism should give way to the sense of optimism that there are opportunities in South Asia that with a, with a different institutional mechanism, with a different focus, with a different uh, you know, uh, aspiration, India can shape and India can manage. And I think that is something that, uh, that one needs to uh, you know, sort of uh, look at when one is looking at regionalism, multilateralism uh, in South Asia today and how South Asia can be reimagined. Uh, I will uh, you know, just end here because I think there are, um, uh, I have uh, spoken enough and I think there are other very uh, capable people who have come after me who will shed light on different aspects. But, but I think the essential point with which I want to end is that as students of South Asia, as those of us who study South Asia, I think we need to be a bit more nimble and flexible in terms of looking at the questions that we are asking. Uh, we can only ask questions. It is for policymakers like Ambassador Trigunayat to provide answers. But, uh, but you know, the questions that we need to ask need to be more uh, 
I think, in sync with the larger reality on the ground, rather than consistently lamenting the fact that South Asia's regionalism, multilateralism in, in the region is a dead end. And I think most of the questions that we have been asking so far have been relatively uh, in, a, in a single frame rather than you know, changing that frame of reference and allowing new possibilities to emerge. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, Dr. Jadeev, sir. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Professor Dr. Son Singh, sir, your comments, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Gurinder Singh, uh, Professor Nagalakshmi Raman, and Dr. Jadeev Parida, who's uh, one of our own. And it's a matter of delight that MIT is creating opportunities for our students. So we sincerely appreciate the JNU scholars are getting opportunities to grow further in their life, thanks to MIT family. My friend, Professor Pant just now mentioned that how geographies can be reimagined differently when you reimagine South Asia. So in 60s, when ASEAN was being created, and they invited Sri Lanka to become part of uh, Southeast Asia. But for a long time, Afghanistan was not seen as part of uh, South Asia. Then it became part of South Asia. There's often conversation whether Myanmar should be part of South Asia. So there is a definitely a way of reimagining geographies. I also agree with Professor Pant, there is a way of recalibrating states who would be dormant in terms of their contributions and states that will be hyperactive in both shaping and being shaped by how regionalism or multilateralism evolves, in this case in South Asia. And therefore, in that sense, we could think of China as being part of South Asia or being an external player. So I agree that, uh, as Professor Pan said, there are different ways of imagining states and geographies. And let me go to the step next. Look beyond geographies uh, and states. Uh, in fact, the contemporary debates uh, on multilateralism of course, are partly triggered by the fact that there is a big narrative about uh, multilateralism being on retreat. You know, in case of global institutions, United States, the most powerful state that constituted most of international institutions is on retreat. The greatest experiment of European Union, Britain is on retreat. And of course, uh, you can see also what is happening to SARC since 2016. So there is a fashionable debate about uh, multilateralism being on retreat and the alternative multilateralism led by Chinese is generally nothing but a compilation of multiple bilaterals. And Belt and Road Initiative is an example here. So academics go back to again churning ideas about multilateralism, multipolarism, minilateralism, polycentricism, plurilateralism. But the new ideas on the table, as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned, and I, let me say COVID-19 will be nothing more than an inflection point, uh, which will not uh, create as a, you know, a entirely new world order, but will accelerate certain processes and decelerate certain processes. And that is how it will change and create the new normal, including for multilateralism. So where is the academic debate on multilateralism moving? We are hearing today ideas about democratic multilateralism. We are hearing ideas about people-centric multilateralism. So states are not necessarily the central axis. In fact, we are hearing a more interesting idea of complex multilateralism by Professor Richard Woodward of Coventry University, UK. 
so there are new ideas on the table as to how the very institution and culture of multilateralism its l itself is being sort of a mind to develop new ideas out of the box and therefore when we look at the reshaping of the global world order as we reimagine south asia we have to understand that already multilateralism was moving way beyond the state structures what is the most important uh, example of multilateralism united nations for about 30 years now united nations itself has gone way beyond engaging only states otherwise it is only united nations but it now does much more work beyond nation states and sometimes to the discomfort of nation states and a good example for all of us would be how peace keeping has evolved into peace making peace building peace enforcement and in all of these activities it is much greater engagement of united nations with peoples on the grassroots ground level ngos ngos civil society iconic leaders so to some extent state was already under question as not being the sole proprietor of how multilateralism will be viewed and same is happening in most regions so let us look at sark which is often seen as the central axis of multilateralism in south asia which i contest it is not sark is not the you know beginning and end of multilateralism in in south asia very often examples to compare it with european union or asean completely misplaced are about half a century old debate we should shed them and and look afresh how is even sark being engaged and sark is often seen in terms of headlines of summit meetings not happening fine if summit meetings not happening doesn't mean end of multilateralism in south asia there's so much more infrastructure that has happened even in terms of institutions of south asia which are sark centric which are still functioning so if summit meetings are not happening that doesn't mean end of multilateralism in south asia now we notice that recently after a long gap of almost 5 years pandemic covid 19 triggered a new initiative and then you had indian prime minister initiating an urgent need to have sark leaders sit together and i want you to carefully understand how did indian prime minister articulate that sentiment in a tweet announcing this summit meeting that was to happen he said i would like to propose that the leadership of sark nations chart out a strong strategy to fight the corona virus specific centric a issue specific centric so what we are seeing today issues and actors in multilateralism are completely redefining how we understand multilateralism and the tweet continues to say that we could discuss via video conference ways to keep our citizens healthy the focus is on citizens health and the last line is most interesting because it says together we can set an example to the world and contribute to a healthier planet i think the message in reshaping of the global world order through reimagining south asia is very clearly underlined here how south asia can actually create possibilities of a healthier planet by focusing on its citizens why because this is the most densely populated region on the planet and if pandemic is for the first time a real human challenge not first world war not second world war not great depression not spanish flu nothing was as global as covid 19 it has gone across 216 countries 
it has impacted everybody around the world. No such challenge ever was experienced in human history. And if the largest concentration of human population is in South Asia, then the approach has to be clearly human-centric approach. And that juxtaposes and blends perfectly with the changing culture, nature, and institutionalization of multilateralism, which is becoming people-centric. Look at the recent examples of multilateral initiatives. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. All of them have started about two to three. In the case of BRICS, for example, there are 50 events that precede every summit meeting. And that is to create strong foundations, create constituencies, because some of the old initiatives on creating multilateralism like European Union, ASEAN, or SARC were not based in creating those stronger foundations where there are societal constituencies that wish to build and see stakes. And if it is only leaders' initiatives and leader-centric, then their whims and fancies will often impact the way multilateralism works. But if it is a bottoms up approach, which is what is multilateralism is moving towards, then I think clearly we are reimagining South Asia, which is going to be driven by this new genre of multilateralism. It will only support the conventional visions of multilateralism, which is where SARC is at the center. So what happened when 25th, 15th of March that meeting happened? Of course, Pakistan sent only a special advisor. They did not attend at the level of head of government or state. But it immediately created a fund of $18, billion, $18 million. India, of course, offered to contribute $10 million. And then it was immediately followed 10 days later on 26th March a meeting of senior health professionals of South Asia. And they immediately decided three steps forward. One was to share online tools, best practices, share online tools on how to deal with situation that was faced by emergency responders or the Corona warriors as we sometimes call. Second was to set up an electronic disease surveillance platform to share real-time information. And third was most important to reactivate the SARC Disaster Management Center, which is based in India, in Gujarat. So professionals have to be allowed to move forward in dealing with this specific issue of health crisis for the region without connecting it to how the leaders engage with each other, where they have, they have the chemistry, they, they have camaraderie or not, doesn't matter. So it's a bottoms up approach, which is where I think we have to understand where South Asia puts much greater onus on India, but India is not seen as a largest state, as a largest economy, as a largest geography. Therefore, you know, triggering impulses of uh, small state syndrome, among others. No, that's an old fashioned approach to looking at multilateralism, which is state centric. If you turn that into a complex or democratic or people centric multilateralism, then it only raises issues and looks at who can resolve and, and, and address those challenges. And if it is professionals, professionals will be coordinating fast forward, moving forward. And in that sense, they will be taking those initiatives. And again, South Asia has several great examples. We have example of Indus Water Treaty. We have example of non-attack on nuclear installations of each other. Uh, 1987, much before these India-Pakistan became nuclear, they had already signed an agreement not to attack each other's nuclear installations. Sometimes we look at India-Pakistan only problem, problem, problem. Now, same South Asia, way back in 1999, Chinese talk about health Silk Road from 2017. 
South Asia, way back in 1999, had started something called South Asian People Health Forum. Sorry, South Asian Public Health Forum. And look at what they imagined as professionals, which is how contemporaneous it becomes today. What they wanted to do, improve communications amongst public health professionals of South Asia in South Asia, and also public health professionals around the world with interest in South Asia. For example, South Asia produces a very large number of health sector workforce, which may be around the world. Second important element which they took as their responsibility was to demarcate health information and disseminate health information and do that online. Now, today we are all talking online. But go back 20 years, 1990, 30 years, 1999. Imagining that dissemination of real-time information using online platforms is something that the South Asian Public Health Professionals Forum had already started. And that is why the, the, the capacity that they have today to deliver is very different. So they have something called ProMed email, which has thousands of people on it. And they are constantly sharing real-time information on infections, on infectious diseases, on best practices, and things like this. So if we have to reimagine uh, South Asia, we have to begin to go beyond state-centric understanding of multilateralism, even geography-centric uh, understanding of multilateralism, and follow the contemporaneous debates which are seeing multilateralism being completely redesigned by new issues on the table and new issues empower new actors. And they are rapidly defined, redefining how multilateralism is, is going to work. So in 2005, for example, SARC itself had decided to involve so many other stakeholders as observers, special invitees, so some change, even in the old fashioned approach to multilateralism was already happening. The confidence of SARC leaders to allow other nations to come and sit there as observers was showcasing, to expand it to include Afghanistan, which is a conflict zone, was showcasing that two things, confidence in their own camaraderie, but also acceptance of how multilateralism itself is transforming over a period of time. COVID-19, my assumption is, is going to accelerate that process of multilateralism itself is being redesigned and how some new issues like health issues will come forward. And once health issues come forward, and that's my last minute or a minute, a half, minute and a half of a comment, India would not be seen as a largest geographical state in the being 80% of the economic growth of South Asia or economy of South Asia, India would be seen as world's pharmacy. India produces low cost generic medicines, not only for South Asia, for the rest of the world. So hydroxychloroquine of India is going to 150 nations today. And that doesn't look at India as a large nation, small nation, big military, small military. It's only producer of low cost generic medicines. And to underline this very interesting fact is also to know that in terms of volumes, India is the third largest producer of these medicines. But in terms of value, 13th largest. That shows how much low cost medicines India is able to produce. And India will be a major contributor Serum Institute of India will lead that campaign to produce units of any vaccine that is produced anywhere, whether in India or in Oxford or in Moderna or in Chinese firm or in Russian, who will produce 8 billion units. India will be a major stakeholder, not as a powerful military, but as a state that has professional capacities. India was also, even before COVID-19, known as a medical tourism destination because it's easier to get into queue and get cured in India than in many of the developed nations where queues are longer and treatments are so expensive. 
India would also be seen for contributing to enormous numbers of healthcare providers who are working not only in India, they are working around the world. India now is becoming extremely attractive destination for telemedicine. And finally, the largest experiment of Prime Minister Modi called Ayushman Bharat, a healthcare project which is the largest of its kind on planet Earth. So India would be viewed very differently, not in terms of its hard power, but in terms of its professional capacities, its innovation, its low cost solutions. In this case for the pandemic, but also in many other areas, the new challenges of climate change, human trafficking, all kinds of other challenges which we could also become attractive contributors to not seek power but seek influence in molding way of life around the world. So once we begin to follow academic debates of where the redesigning of multilateralism is happening, you will notice that some of those changing were already being adopted and assimilated in South Asia. And COVID-19 according to me is perhaps an opportunity where, you know, those stakeholders who wanted to redesign South Asia's multilateralism and therefore contribute to the redesigning of the global world order can use this opportunity of COVID-19 pandemic to accelerate those processes so that in the new normal, we are not hostages of the old conventional Cold War mindset of state-centric, force-centric, power-centric, multipolarism but we can move to the redesigning of what is being called now democratic, people-centric and complex multilateralism. And I think a, a certain amount of contribution in that direction is already visible the way India is operating, both in dealing with the challenges at home, but also in helping our neighbors in dealing with those challenges. And therefore, I think we should not overestimate and too much assert you know, repeatedly as to whether India is shifting from South to BIMSTEC or BBIN, they are all overlapping. They all contribute to each other. The moment we begin to look beyond the old fashioned territoriality of geographies, of states, of military powers, then some of those lines that have been lines of division will become posts of building partnerships where you engage each other rather than disengage each other. So that new look, I think, is something that academics are already contributing. And some of the leaders have understood and are pushing that forward. And I think we need to, all of us, not just understand, but also assert that change and, and endorse that that is the change which is worth making. And that is how the future holds some of the promise, and which is where this pandemic can become not just an inflection point, but an opportunity to redesign multilateralism in South Asia and then provide an example for us of the world. Thank you so much and I look forward to any comments and questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's really enlightening speech. And I also like to thank you, Professor Haspan, for his introductory remarks. Now I'd like to welcome Ambassador Trigunath, sir, to his uh, introductory remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening. Namaste. Uh, you know, I am really grateful to you all for inviting me because there are several organizations that are doing this and this is an extremely important topic on which uh, we are discussing today. Uh, Professor Gurinder Singh, group chairman, recalled about the Pan-Africa e-network in which Amity University was one of the key uh, partners for providing the e-education. Uh, I remember that very uh, vividly because I was posted in Africa. And I realized that this African e-network project, in my view, was probably the first really effective digital multilateralism approach by India across Africa. It took several years. And today, now we are seeing a newer version of it. And that is in the form of e-Vidya Bharati or the e-Arugya Bharati, thousands of African students are being trained in the Indian universities and across through e-learning platforms. Now that is something that India has always done. 
as far as multilateralism is concerned that is in our psyche that is in our philosophy and our way of life we always talk of vasudev kutumbakam the world is family we are not looking into only one smaller region or a smaller country or the bigger country we think of everything as one whole and we try to contribute as effectively as possible and as my dear friends both of them professor harsh pant and uh, professor sonan singh have talked about it in great detail and i think there's nothing much left to be said as far as the topic is concerned but we are living in different times covid 19 has been the biggest disruptor what we are seeing today is that most of the countries have gone through recession terrible recession including india everybody is suffering and it is extremely difficult for countries to come back and to attend to the basics that are extremely important what are the three basics for the world today in my view there are three h one is the health which is extremely important and i always believed that as far as health is concerned we should be able to every country actually individually must be able to devote sufficient attention or exactly the same attention that they do to the defense of their nation because you need a healthy population a healthy world a healthy country second is hunger which is still very much prevalent everywhere if you look at africa if you look in asia look elsewhere there are problems and these problems are going to be combined and must be addressed and another most important thing is habitat climate change that is extremely important apart from that there are many challenges that we face like terrorism the cyber security the next artificial intelligence the dust revolution 4.0 how shall we land there whether to be a soft landing or a hard landing for majority of the countries more importantly whether the countries in the world will get the vaccine and how will they get it they can only get it when we are talking of vaccine as a global good prime minister modi recently said that india will definitely try to provide because we are going to hopefully manufacture enough uh, vaccines that we are going to give it to uh, indians as well as the our partners across the world we have done so already we have shown it so it can't be a bragging it is not boasting it is in the nature of india to do so to work together and that's why when we provided medicines to 150 countries across the world during the pandemic that is something to talk about india's claim to be a leader in a multilateral world we have seen that multilateralism today is not we may not say it's on retreat but definitely under tremendous stress it has been under stress for a very very long time but the multilateral organizations whether the united nations or other allied agencies of the have been able to come up to the standards and expectations of the people no certainly not the reason is not because the it can only be the sum of its parts and if the certain parts which are the most important part of a, a system do not work according to the rules or according to the global commons obviously the the subdivide rate and that's precisely what has happened when the united nations was formed in uh, 1945 india was the founding member of it we had the un security council in which there were five members who because of the victor vanquish syndrome or whether because of the victor's conclave they wanted to retain the right to say no i have always believed that this is something negative it is a non democratic negative right that the five p5 countries enjoy and you see the history of them it has not really prevented any wars but what it has done essentially is okay bring people to this hall where everybody can come to the table and talk and say something but at the end of the day these countries when their geopolitical interests are there they tend to uh, subvert the system completely and thereby large number of countries even though they want un and other organizations to function effectively are quite very uh, how is it going to work out so therefore a reformed multilateralism is an extremely important thing which india has been advocating for a long time 
it cannot continue to reflect the 1945 mindset. And therefore, it is important that there are certain reforms, not only in the UN Security Council, for which there are three or four clements we are working together, like G4 countries. Each country has its own problems with certain countries in the 193 member body. But India is the one country where there is, except for China perhaps, and Pakistan, the other country, most of the countries basically agree that India could be the member of the table. How it is going to be, whether it will be with veto, without a veto, in my view, if it is without veto, it has no meaning then. You are back to the square one. But reforms are needed if the relevance of this global body has to continue. So that's on the larger scale that we are seeing. We have seen what happened during the pandemic. The kind of fights that we saw at the WHO and eventually President Trump left World Health Organization. Now that is a very childish move. I mean, you are throwing the baby out of the bathwater. I mean, this is quite a stupid thing. So, but he has done it. Wherever it has not served their narrow geopolitical foreign policy interests, they have not bothered about the organization. We have seen how it has operated in a unilateralism manner. Now today you have 190 countries on one side or maybe five countries on the other. Out of five, there are three and two ratio currently. While US, UK and France on the one side, you see the Russia and China on the other. So this is a divided field and where you will never get a single position by all the countries unless everybody's uh, interests are addressed. That is not the way it was supposed to be. It was supposed to have ensure peace and security and development for everyone. And that is quite possible. Professor uh, Soren Singh and Professor Pan talked about the other multilateral organizations in our region or G20 or EU or others. Uh, they are there. They are serving the interests of their members, narrow member, they are also. So we are seeing the plurilateral arrangements that are moving around in different parts of the world in the hope that they will deliver the right kind of uh, inputs and the right kind of impetus to the global body. Whether it will happen or not, we are not quite sure as how it is going to be. Coming back to our region, because that is what the real topic is all about. Friends, I think that you cannot choose your neighbor. That is a given. They are a gift of geography in the geopolitical sense. And they also have some congenital problems and suffer from sibling rivalries like humans and are complicated in their bilateral or multilateral discourse by the historic baggage or external inducements and machinations. Often land and territorial issues get merged with sovereignty dimensions which becomes complex with engineered domestic politics of the country and the region. India, which is of a continental size and proportion, is no exception. Whatever India does or says, as of now, it may change in future, and it should change in future, because this is not what India is, that the neighbors of India do suffer from this big brother syndrome it has impacted our function. They like us, but at the same time, now they have another bigger neighbor in China, which is also as much a neighbor of almost all countries as India is. For China and its politics is extremely important in containing India within the region, either through a string of pearls or by BRI or whatever, so we can see, secondly, it has another state which it has added to its own geographical dimension is unfortunately Pakistan. The SARC, which was started by Bangladesh, President Shah continued to work, bring the region together for a long time. It is not that there has been any dearth of effort from India's part. It is on a fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is that you cannot use cross-border terrorism as an instrument of your state policy. If Pakistan was really keen, really wanted to work, system to work, 
it could have just given up this it has not it has impacted it also to some extent but it has made into a haven of terrorism and problem with pakistan in our region has been and we have to look at it in longer way it has been used to be in a part of under the wings of a big power whether it was the usa at one time cento and all those or china now it is trying to work together with russia as well so today the problem of the world in my view is c square a china covid 19 and america that cold war 2.0 which is going on is not allowing the world to jointly address the biggest challenge that is facing us and that is covid 19 un has not been able to have unsc has not been able to have a meeting every leader has spoken about covid 19 and since that but they could not come out with a resolution till date because of the china what happened in who because of china an irresponsible state with a wolf warrior diplomacy on top of it non transparent style of functioning bullying the world and i was surprised when i heard president xi jinping at the unba he's talking about the us bullying us hegemon us bossism that this cannot be allowed to continue look inside what have you been doing here to your all your neighbors that is something that has to be do so the duplicity in the international behavior is causing a problem and rupturing the very fabric of the uh, of the multilateralism that is probably could be possible reforms will have to take place that has to be done there now as far as india is concerned and its neighbors are concerned i mean we are consistently followed a policy a non reciprocal policy and we have always believed that an economically stronger neighbor is an asset for its own security india security but it has had its share of difficulties in maintaining the relationship comfortable level with our neighbors at one time or the other since neighborhood is no choice and a stronger neighbor with a balanced outlook is a prerequisite for one's own growth our non reciprocal policy provided the maximum possible assistance especially through preferential market access capacity building and investments and security as well as counter terrorism metrics india also has emerged as a first responder and often a security provider whether it is water shortages or whether sharing intelligence with sri lanka about the terrorist attack or earthquake in nepal or for that matter the initiative which professor sonanthan gave talked about in detail prime minister modi's initiative to call the sat uh, leaders uh, for discussing the covid strategy and creating the covid fund and started working on it in no time apart from that india is also ready to uh, test the vaccines along with them now india's only expectation has been that the neighbors would eschew any temptation which might affect india adversely especially its security be it through terrorism or through economic projects that are inimical to its own growth and development we had entered into gujral doctrine long back we provided huge and favorable investments and lines of credit and grants for that matter the neighborhood first policy continues to be the primary objective of the government and it is continuing to do so but the world has changed so while you are trying to create a multilateral institution reimagining its functioning whether it is through neighborhood and actis policy combining whether alternate institutions are uh, being created whether bbi and bimstech they are all going to be part of the same big one all these may continue to be there but at the same time will they remain in the same basket i doubt very much because the world is evolving the countries in the neighborhood have become much smarter today they are looking in a more transactional manner as far as the relationships are concerned when they want to take the benefits from both sides and why not i mean it's in the national interest when america talks america first india talks of india first china talks of china first then every country thinks of itself first now whatever uh, diplomatic tools and dimensions are available to them they would use it to get that advantage 
Now, if they try to play one against the other, but I don't think India can enter into that game and should not enter because we need to have the long-term historic, cultural, civilizational partnership that exists and we must be able to build upon it. India has to be large-hearted in many ways. Sometimes has to give in, even when it is not probably appropriate. But we have done so in the past and we would be doing so. And I think that we are, what we are looking at it in the near future at least, that whatever system of multilateralism is going to come out of it, it probably will not have Pakistan on board in the same manner as other members are there. We have seen it recently in the meeting which was held of the foreign minister. So it is something, now can we not look at, as Professor uh, also mentioned, that can we not look at Asia into a bigger, larger Asia, the whole of Asia. For us, West Asia is equally important, where also tremendous upheaval is taking place. Act East policy. We are not members of the RCP. Many of the ASEAN countries are feeling let down by that. We are not there. Of course, it's, we have to look after our interests. How can we use our Atmanirbhar policy in combining the strengths of all the neighboring countries and providing them the market and other things. So they, I think that there is so much of things in flux that are happening. And as I said, you have no choice. They are neighbors. If they grow, you grow. If they have a problem, you will have a problem eventually. The COVID, whether it is pandemic or whether it is other kind of uh, cyber attacks or everything else, they are all going to have an impact uh, on the neighbors at one time or the other. But we are seeing it that what, whoever wants to come with you, whoever wants to follow and feels invested in the kind of organization that we are looking at uh, as a multilateral body or on uh, trilateral, multilateral, or whatever form it comes out to be, we need to work on it. And India will have to take lead. India has to be the engine of growth in the region, irrespective of whatever we think. So I will stop here and I'll be very happy to answer questions. There's so much one can talk about the multilateralism and the global scale, but within the region, despite the riders that we have spoken about, I think the, uh, the, the new next part of the 21st century should allow us to move forward rather than compete. Because today's competition with China has become very negative in a stone and tanner. It has put nearly every country uh, on the back foot. You are, you are yet, you are just got to think about how it is going to react in a certain way, if it has reacted this way in the recent past. Maybe it is in a hurry to displace USA, but then that is going to uh, dishevel the whole world uh, systems and which is not a good thing. And therefore India, which is a sane voice in this whole uh, milieu, uh, has to take the lead. In my view. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That is really fascinating experience that we have learned now. So with this, I'd like to welcome uh, Ambassador Dr. Sambhu uh, sir, to give his introductory remarks. Sir, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Well, first of all, uh, let me begin by thanking the three institutions uh, for bringing such a large group of uh, uh, scholars, students, academicians, policymakers, practitioners together to reflect on this uh, very important relevant topic. Uh, as the last speaker, uh, one of the last speakers in this very distinguished panel with very accomplished uh, scholars and diplomats, the task becomes easy in the sense that most of what has to be said has been said. Now, as I take part in many of these uh, uh, academic and practical uh, practitioners' discourses and compare uh, many of those things with the state of the world today, I'm reminded of uh, my, one of my favorite um, Indian writers, Nirad Choudhury, 
and his book, The Three Horsemen of a New Apocalypse, where he says, man's greatest happiness lies in living on the strength of his illusions. What makes this uh, uh, discussion different in the sense that uh, amidst the paradoxes of our time that many of the speakers have talk, talked about, among which I find four very striking ones, globally, but South Asia as a showcase of those paradoxes. On the one hand, you have tremendous prosperity and wealth creation. And amidst that, sometimes South Asia is also known as the largest home to the largest numbers of the world's hungry and angry. Demonstrated by the poverty and destitution amidst such prosperity, conflict and violence. The second, the world craves for an environment of peace and security. And yet, there is so much conflict and violence that in fact we exist in an environment where people are talking about other great conflicts happening in our region, destined for war. You know the famous book. You have so much physical means to communicate. No one can appreciate the tremendous transformation in science and technology, especially in the transport and communication technology than myself, because I was born and raised in the remote hills of Nepal at a time when the official policy of the state was isolation from the rest of the world, that there was no uh, transportation, there was no communication. For almost three, four months in a year, as a student studying in Kathmandu, I was completely cut off from my family, not very far from Kathmandu. And yet, have these physical means to communicate, instant communication, transform the human will to communicate with each other? If we had, would we see what we are seeing today? And of all this, I was very delighted. In fact, I'm very happy that Amity University takes the lead in transfer of knowledge. What I see as the fourth and perhaps the most striking of all our challenges in this paradox is the unbelievable access to knowledge and technology. And yet oftentimes a very sad commentary on human wisdom for which South Asia and especially this region is known for. So that is what, in my view, makes our discussion, especially you know, the, uh, the opening and then the series of uh, papers that uh, uh, were read and, and discussed the whole two days. And of course, the, uh, the validator session now and the distinguished speakers before me. In the, in the um, opening, I think it was Vice Chancellor uh, Professor Sukla who talked about the outcome. And my very respected uh, uh, and dear friend, Professor Muni, talked about the two, especially the two lines of thought in terms of the discourse in international relations especially one, the so-called creative, imaginative, idealist sort of school. And then the overly state and power centric notion of realism. For all of this, 
especially to have the right kind of outcome. When we are talking about multilateralism in the context of interstate relations, as to what motivates states to cooperate. I think the understanding of time and space in which we are operating and in which we are discussing the topic. But liberating and of course not remaining prisoners of geography and history, I think is a very critical factor that especially in a forum like this, mostly by participated by scholars. And of course, few of us who have seen both sides of the fence, so to speak, uh, are involved. And in doing so, the centrality of South Asia in this matrix of time and space, and especially India, uh, I think is very critical. Now, when I talk about this understanding of history and geography, and of course, its relationship with multilateralism. You know that today we are celebrating, or we are in fact commemorating the 75th year, 70th year of the end of the Second World War. And of course, the 75th year of the founding of the United Nations, which essentially was the result of the failure of its predecessor institution, the League of Nations, and of course the start of the Second World War. It is in that perspective, and of course the continuing dysfunctionality of the institution we brought to the South Asian level, the SARC, and of course our aspiration to look for alternatives, including BIMSTEC. It's in this backdrop that we are talking about multilateralism in South Asia. Had the United Nations especially conceptualized on, in the aftermath of the death and devastation of the two world wars and the vision of the leaders of that time of a new concept, of a new vision of world order, a new paradigm of collective security, collective prosperity and collective dignity as enshrined in the three main institutions of the UN, Security Council, Economic and Social Council, and the Human Rights Commission, which is now called Human Rights Council, were enshrined. Had they succeeded, perhaps we would not be talking about multilateralism in South Asia. What happened was the, the Cold War swallowed those aspirations of a change in behavior, change in behavior of the, of the individuals in terms of the way we treat our, each other, the way we treat mother nature or the creations of mother nature, the behavior of institutions that we represent at different stages in different levels and times. And of course, the behavior of the institution, human mind has thought of so far called the nation state, the most important and the most powerful institution. Had they changed learning the lessons of history and of course, significance of geography, perhaps th things would have been different. When we are talking about reimagining South Asia, and of course talking about multilateralism. I'm reminded of the third SARC summit, two to four November, 1987 in Kathmandu. At that time, I was an academic. I was working for the Thiruvan University. And of course the university organized a seminar called SARC Retrospect and Prospect. In that seminar, I had one very short paper wherein I talked about on three things. One is the charter, wherein it forbids political and contentious issues. Because 
contentious, all significant issues have some elements of contentiousness. And if you cannot address those important elements, then of course this whole idea that technical economic sort of issues only can drive interstate cooperation. There's a lot of debate on that. There are scholars who would argue functionalists think that that can happen, but then there are others who are saying no. Important issues of security and nationality, nationalism are important. So one was the issue I raised of the, the deficiency in the charter. Second was the issue of institution. Many of us who have been involved in the SARC process, I'm sure Ambassador knows this, is the SARC Secretary General for a long time used to sit in a little corner outside where the uh, heads of states and the heads of government are interacting. The reason I talked about the institution is for, you know, historically and even today, nations interact and interface with other nations on the basis of what they call national interest. The famous saying, in foreign policy, there are no permanent friends or permanent enemies, only permanent interests. But what the vision of SAR, of course, earlier vision of the UN, was that there are so going to be so many issues where if nation states only look at it from their traditional, narrow, national interest perspective, no country, irrespective of how powerful they may be, are able to resolve some of those emerging issues. Climate is a case. Terrorism is another one. Migration is another one. The COVID-19 is a classic example. I remember when I was in Geneva as ambassador, I remember Gro Harlem Brundtland discussing the international health regulation. Precisely because we knew at that time that if a major pandemic hit the world, nations would behave exactly like they are doing today. Closing borders, stopping flow of medicines, and this. That is why that regulation was happened. Had that been understood, the, the visionary, very, very dynamic step that Prime Minister Modi took, irrespective of India's historical approach to SAR, that when the pandemic hit the world, in fact, before it had started hitting this region so badly, he envisioned the, the magnitude of the problem. And as a result, he called for SARC level cooperation. In fact, India even proposed a huge budget for SARC countries to come together. But has that been translated? So it is time for us to reflect why that is happening. Many times my friends in India invite me to come and talk about Bimstead, as SARC is dysfunctional and it's natural. But I continue to argue that in fact, if we cannot redress some of the same reasons which have made SARC dysfunctional, then what is the guarantee that Bimstead will function? And that is why my third point at that meeting way back in 1987 was the question of leadership of the institution. Because the role of a regional organization and its leadership is to harmonize national interest of all countries into a collective regional good. That was the reason UN failed, because the UN leadership was not able to translate the classical traditional national interest of major powers into a larger global good. And as a result, scholars thought of the idea that if you, we could disaggregate the international cooperation issue to a more regional level, where countries have similar aspirations, similar needs, similar cultures, that in fact, there would be greater cooperation in economic and security field. So the role of the Secretary General in what is regarded as 
collective legitimization of individual interest is very important. But I, as I referred to the role of the Secretary General, how does a Secretary General who neither has the mandate nor the level to try and bring together such complex issues? So unless we address these issues, then a reimagining of multilateralism in South Asia is wonderful to talk about, but I don't see it happening. And that is why COVID-19, I was delighted that uh, you know, Dr. Singh in his, in his you know, inaugural uh, process articulated this idea very much in the sense that we must not let COVID defeat us. Absolutely. We need to collectively make that you know, united decision. And so we must cooperate. We must exchange our experiences. India is leading, um, as it came out, comes out very clearly in the medicine, medical area. And of course, the magnanimous leadership that Prime Minister Modi has demonstrated, I think is, is very good. We need to take it up. But Dr. Singh, there is the reason I talked of the significance of time and space is in fact, there might be even a larger threat that our region faces. And so COVID is a big, nobody really knows, in my view, up to now. You can look at COVID in different areas. My own perception, my own thinking, although I'm not a medical practitioner, is in fact, it's partly mother nature's warning to humankind that change your behavior. One simple thing is what Gandhiji talks about, the voluntary control of needs and consumption. What is it that a society that claims to have changed so much in terms of eliminating poverty cannot change the culture of eating bats? That in fact, because we have the power that we can treat all other creations of mother nature in terms of what only our perspective is, that in fact, all other creatures have the right to exist. And of course, mostly so exotic. And so in a way, I think it requires a change in behavior. But more important I'm talking about is the issue of peace and security. That in fact, how the reason I reminded of the 70 and 75 years is this reason has now emerged as one of the principal epicenters of the post Cold War global paradigm flux. One paradigm has shifted, have shifted, but what is the nature of the new paradigm? We don't know. And the nature of that paradigm will largely depend on US-China relations, China-India relations. There is the centrality of India. And there, when you talked about the transfer of knowledge, let me conclude with, the, with remembering uh, the uh, scholar in whose name uh, we are meeting here today. Chanakya's Arthasastra is too big. It's the biggest treatise on statecraft. So I do not claim to be a, a scholar on that, on that issue. But there is one sloka that, that I love of Chanakya. He says, Ahara nindra bhayamai thunani samani chaitani nadam pasunam gyanam narana madiko viseso gyane nahina pasubi samana. Which essentially means as I was referring to before, that this notion of jnana transcends the idea of knowledge, which is essentially externally acquired. That externally acquired knowledge, defined by your own experience, life experiences, further refined by your jnana, chetana, which makes the human creations, the human species, different from the rest of the species. That is what Chanak is saying. That if you lose Gyan and you start behaving a Gyani, 
disasters happen. COVID-19, maybe even more disastrous things. Big human, uh, this, uh, human uh, created disasters like wars. So as a result, I'm delighted that I have been invited to share some of my very scattered thoughts, thoughts on uh, in this very important platform. I have been a part of the National Defense University in Nepal, partly because I do not see, in fact, there are lots of very high level scholarship and institutions. Every time we talk of scholarships, we think of Harvard, we think of, think of Oxford, Cambridge, and so on. But, you know, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, which is, in fact, Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development, he's the, it was his brainchild when he was uh, economic advisor to Kofi Annan. He wrote a book called Commonwealth. And writing a foreword in his book, another Harvard professor writes, we exist in a bizarre combination of Stone Age emotions, medieval beliefs and institutions, but God-like technology. That is how we have lurched into what we call the 21st century. I think that is very telling that in fact today, even those centers called powerhouses of ideas don't have the answer. So as a result today, the whole intellectual edifice on which prosperous and secure democracies as nation states, but also as the reasons is shaking. And as a result, we need to employ the knowledge that we have gained externally by defining and refining with what Chanakya talks of as Ghana. That I think is the remedy to the paradoxes I'm talking about. For this, I really appreciate your, your listening and time. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That was an excellent dissemination of knowledge uh, we were uh, looking forward to. Uh, now, uh, our great visionary, our founder, President Sir, has joined us. So today, Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, Sir, is with us. It's a blessing for me and for, of course, the entire institution also. Uh, today, uh, I would like, to, if I talk about his vision, he has translated into internationally benchmarked campuses that have come to epitomies of Amity Education Group. This, currently, this group, uh, we have around 95,000 plus students pursuing 240, pro, 240 programs from nursery to PhD across 15 campuses spread over 1,000 acres. So that is his, I know, the vision. That is, this is unmatched growth of Amity's culmination of globally benchmarked high-tech campuses, a dedicated faculty comprising through world thought leaders and practicing professionals, innovative teaching, methodology, and unparalleled corporate interactions. Uh, I would, uh, before I call upon the next speaker, I would like to, uh, uh, like to talk, uh, I'd like to uh, invite our founder, sir, uh, to have a words of wisdom. You know, his vision, you know, his dreams is always believed uh, in the policy of lending one eye on vision and one eye on implementation. So uh, that is what his vision is. Uh, it's, I, 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 sometimes, I don't get words to express his vision. Uh, it's that he just instructs and we execute. That is how it goes. You know, uh, the, the education, the sustainable, the education, the landscape that he has uh, developed, you know, uh, th that's unparalleled. And, and he always focuses uh, on uh, the four E's uh, that he always um, uh, mentions, that is edge, enthusiasm, excellence, and execution in all walks of life. Sir, I would uh, request you, I'll call upon Founder President, sir, to have a word of wisdom, to listen to him. Dr. Nagalakshmi? Yes, sir. Thank you, I sir. I was hearing, uh, I heard the Professor Harsh Pant, I heard, then Swaram Singh Ji, I heard. I was just hearing the ambassador, uh, Singh Tadaji, and have Anil Prignas uh, also spoken or else he will speak? No, he has spoke, sir. Professor Jay Prashad, sir, has to speak. Okay. So Jay Prakash has to speak. Uh, Jay Prashad. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Jay Prasad. Yes, sir. Uh, 
that is two possibility okay i think after me i'll not take much time sir i uh, would like to hear your problem sir <laughs> you have created me a lot of problem all sir <laughs> those who are hearing to all speakers i am astonished amazed and surprised this is my problem how she has selected the topic because you all know much much better than me you know all know you are experts in this you have been researching on it yes, the neighbor is more important than the best relative and the relation and my neighbors are afghanistan pakistan bangladesh sri lanka uh, Mal maldives nepal and bhutan am i right these are my neighbors now we have to see how we have a most amiable friendly fruitful and reaching relationship with these therefore this seminar organized by dr dagalakshmi together with uh, her dedicated is of immense importance geopolitical importance in in many many ways just half an hour back i alerted my people dr gurinder singh dr silva murthy dr rajiv sharma dr nutan kaushik aram agrawal sk gadiyok yoga jyotsna kapil shukla and kalpana sharma i gave them half an hour time you please write me immediately which are the areas which are the fields in which we can work together with these countries for mutual benefit and mutual interest for mutual development and for mutual enrichment all have this is amity this is amity all have within 20 minutes sent their points also kalpana sharma has sent it their points what can be done because why i am coming in this valedictory nagalakshmi was more than happy and satisfied to have me in the inauguration she did not even invite me but you will all agree with me knowledge expertise spending your valuable time for this 3 days seminar we are immensely grateful to you but now the most important is how way ahead what should be the outcome of this 3 days time where you very kindly were present also my outcome director is has rushed to the conference kapil shukla my group vice chancellor today was in the beginning there so i would ask the speakers how can we i have made as you know mbt uh, mbt uh, we have made this forum uh, mbt south asia forum for action and uh, action and performance what is it for action And and thought, sir. Thought, thought, and action for MIT South Asia, South Asia Forum for Thought and Action. Yes, MIT South Asia Forum for Thought and Action. You people know better than me. There are so many think tanks. The people sit there. They do publications. They write books. This is a thought. This is a vision, but the action fails. So MIT wants to think. like think tanks wants to have thoughts but mit wants to also put this in action that is why you are coming to this three day seminar is your historical present you must have been delivering lecture at global level in various seminars publishing papers i have read a lot about it i wrote to my secretary that print as much details I took a pen from all those who are attending, so he sent me. This is one feet high bundle, and in the meantime, uh, Lakshmi also sent me details about each one of you. It is amazing how how worthy you are, how much experience you have got in these international relations, and with specific target on SARC countries and uh, South Asia. now first thing dr gurinder singh or aram agrawal my ambassador aram agrawal what is uh, what is more popularly used sarc or south asia countries are the same my ambassador agrawal will reply ambassador agrawal 
आई डोंट थिंक दे आर मूव हेलो शिल्पा मूर्ति जी अह मिस्टर अग्रवाल इज अ इज योर सर कैन यू अनमूव यस ओके वी कैन आस्क आवर एंबेसडर राम सिंपाला जी सर यू टेल मी व्हाट इज which term is used more the countries are same sark and south asia which term is more popularly used in the world sark represents an institution whereas south asia is a is a, is a reason geographic uh, terminology okay. but um, i think south asia is more uh, more commonly used right. i don't think many people know about sark right. more people know about south asia than sark That's what I think. Right. So therefore, South Asia just, is used, sir. Yeah, please, Ham. Just now, yes, please. South okay, Asia is used. South Asia is used. South more Asia can, is more uh, more apt for this our forum. More more extensively used. And which is South Asia Thought and Action Forum? Yes, sir. Okay, Dr. Gurinder Singh, uh, what you have because no, it is very important to name a child. If so we have to grow and nurture a child first, the name should be proper. So I am. Now asking you people, is this name of our forum, MIT South Asia Thought and Action Forum, is it the correct name? Absolutely, sir. Dr. Gurinder, Dr. Silma Murthy. Absolutely, I think it's a great name, sir. Yes, so it means the name is okay. Now we have to just ask our worthy present people, those here, what should be our aim? I've got many points. They say in the academic field, in the online education. in cultural education in the area of tourism and uh, hospitality <coughs> sir murthy ji can you uh, articulate your points because these worthy people should listen it because their advice right sir murthy ji can you articulate your points yeah thank you sir see it's very important initiative from amiti to have a forum for south asia and we have to think positively in a futuristic perspective and then contribute to the development because prime minister keep talking about sabka vikas sabke saath so we have to build our neighborhood their capacity because we always think about the inclusive growth we want to grow when india is growing we have to also grow with our neighbors so in that connection i was thinking when founder was asking what we need to do in the south asia being a science and technology person i thought first thing yes the maritime maritime science and technology yeah, that's right first is maritime security because we have straight from persian gulf to straits of malacca the right. indian navy is going to have a large presence in indian ocean region so if that is so we need to give a focus focus on the maritime security because so many vessels so many ships moving across and we need to look at the maritime uh, the security as well as economy the second the part is technology ocean ocean Uh, environmental science the auditor yeah because the ocean science and atmos atmospheric science is a forum in which uh, in this forum we have a tremendous strength in amiti in this area we have a cost center for atmospheric and ocean sciences established in amiti university rajasthan so now we can bring that then technology diplomacy we organized uh, dr nutan kaushik organized for bangladesh nepal bhutan a capacity building workshop on agriculture business agri business so like this we need to build partnership because we should be able to give something if we have to get goodwill back to return to the country then we must we must have uh, we, we have to give something so technology diplomacy is one area in which we should be able to give whatever frugal technologies innovations india has developed amiti has developed through this forum we will be able to develop our prime minister announced uh, uh, the amiti the sark satellite sark satellite this will give a cover to look at the ocean the the if there is a turbulence there if a tsunami is coming so you will be able to predict such changes as well as give the maritime security so this will be given by india as a satellite and which will give services to the sark country so this is technology diplomacy similarly capacity building because we we'll, we like to give in many from many of the students are here in amiti campuses in other campuses in india that we are educating them we are building their capacity knowledge and also the skills soft skills i think this is what is necessary 
then one yes. more thing we should uh, look at sir health cooperation because the there is in who there is a group known as southeast asia health uh, the regional cooperation in health because in covid situation such emergencies will come so how do we immediately join hands with our neighbors to contain this problem so the, i think this type of cooperation in healthcare delivery and predicting the disease and how do we plug this right at the initial stages so i think there are many many areas through which amity that's a forum for thought and action can really no, I, can, i can listen my worthy speakers also bullet wise give me bullet wise points which are the points because we will have to this forum another online uh, meetings consultation i'll be personally present till the root is made people ask me why dr sohan you are so successful we have auto pilot mode management system once the aim is fixed ambassador would know it all over the vice chair pro vice chancellor is there if once the mission and aim is fixed now it is how to achieve it so people ask me how do you achieve dr chauhan my system is auto pilot mode management system i fix the aim dr salamurthy you have to do thousand publications do or die and then i have to see that he doesn't die we do it so <laughs> i ask my i ask my worthy persons those who are speaker is their opinion is of most value what we all should fix the point 10 15 20 points and start working on each point for example cultural we have spoken so my worthy speaker who will tell me eh, gurinder after that i'll ask you bullet wise because this is all being recorded so that i don't lose your each word of yours this is all being recorded tell me what points do you think so that the benefit of this your three years three days seminar is invaluable please who will tell me you are de delivering wonderful lectures anybody i, I, could, give, I could give certain points sir sir okay go vijay gandiok he is a left captain gandiok a most distinguished army officer he was the commandant of which college it was for commandant of staff college yeah staff defense services staff college wellington staff college wellington and he is he has established amity institute of uh, 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 strategic studies and international relations so gandiok uh, please Sir. i would like I, i want your total involvement in this yes sir please uh, sub point form as uh, amity south asia thought and action forum first point partnership in educational research establishment right. of the university with popular education programs right. point number 2 the mou in area of science and technology and ocean development in as far right. as aqua marine products is concerned Right. Point number three: food and security cooperation, exports and imports of items. Point number right. four: industry 4.0, economic development program, and corporate development. Point number five: PC culture, fisheries, industry, and setting up of marine exploration in the areas of continental shelf of these countries. Point number six: defense equipment and technology program. of creating military industrial complex point okay. number 7 shipping and transport industry and cooperation and lastly point number 8 healthcare and pharmaceutical company to be established and assistance provided in covid 19 uh, pandemic environment thank you sir dr nagalakshmi sunra you know you are listening all yes sir uh, yes sir i am listening Success of your webinar. This is the success. I gave them twenty minutes, and in twenty minutes, all have written. You have written. Which should be point? Now I want to listen my worthy speakers. Ah, uh, bro. Well, I want to listen points from them from my worthy speakers. Ah, uh, should I call upon Professor Jay Prashad, sir? Yes. Pra Professor no, Jay Prashad. No, before uh, he speaks, I want to finish this. Uh, okay. Uh, this, uh, bullet points. Okay. Uh, Those were already spoken. They are bullet okay. points for fixing the mission and aim. Uh, so can, Professor, I, can I can I give some ideas? Yeah, please, please. Yes. Please. First of all, uh, it's wonderful that we have your presence. In fact, uh, you are inviting um, 
some very specific uh, ideas. You know, many of the uh, ideas that have been outlined before are also part of the SARG areas of cooperation. One of the comparative advantages of an academic institution, as opposed to you know, uh, institutions of government is, I'm sure my diplomat friends know it well, when we sit in a multilateral forum, that we represent our governments. So as a result, our role is to best articulate the policies set by our governments. That is why I often, when I am engaged in my scholarly work rather than my uh, diplomatic work, I say I take off my traditional Nepali hat, saying I no longer am speaking as a Nepali. Uh, because a scholar is a free thinker, whereas a diplomat has a very specific parameters within which he or she operates. And that's how governments operate. So that has been one of the biggest problems of South Asia. Uh, if you compare why SARC has been dysfunctional, that in fact, uh, so as a result, what I might suggest is one is amity with this very large network of academic disciplines is uh, one uh, immediate preoccupation. If you want something in a, in a uh, immediate, so, uh, medium term, longer term, immediate, we are all preoccupied by COVID-19. Prime Minister Modi has in fact offered to bring together all SAR countries and in fact has pledged a large sum. So if you can, with your um, expertise in the, in the areas of your schools, can, um, you know, bring together SARC level health professionals and health academics and how we redress this particular problem. But in fact, you know, if we don't change our behavior, my own thinking is that this is mother nature's warning to human being that change some of your behaviors. If not, there might be a bigger uh, pandemic. Than this. So how do we redress that? That could be one area. Secondly, um, you know, when South Asian University was being established, Professor J.K. Chadda was a good friend of mine when he was designated CEO or president or whatever it was called. So I did a paper called South Asian University and it was, I forget now, it was something like 28 years of SARC. South Asian University was established after 28 years of SARC. So what is it that people of South Asia expect from South Asian University? Is it going to be one more academic institutions among these so many? Or does South Asian University want to be a distinctive institution that can redress some of the paradoxes I'm talking about in South Asia? So that can only happen with uh, your, your favorite theme, sharing of knowledge, <laughs> sharing of ideas. So if you can create a platform like this, where we can talk much more freely than as academics rather than diplomats, uh, that would be another one. So that would bring the people of South Asia. One of my friends was talking about earlier, Professor Soren Singh, I absolutely agree with him. I um, have talked about this in 1987 as an academic, that in fact, if SARC or South Asia can come together, it can only come together partly on the strength of the public opinions of the people. That in fact, they come together, they create a common identity, because we don't do that. That is what differentiates us from uh, Europe, to a smaller extent, even ASEAN, that in fact, we don't have a common identity. So an institution like yours, under your leadership, can move in that direction, <clears throat> which will facilitate the idea of multilateralism Thank in you, South Asia. Sir. That, that government. Well, so, Dr. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jay Prasad, uh, perhaps uh, you know, we may hear you about eight, 10 minutes, and then we continue this in the meantime, my people will have uh, time to think. Uh, Group Captain Shukla, you can Shukla, you are, uh, you are on mute. Dr. Gurinder Singh, you are on mute. Yeah, absolutely. Sir. We will make an internal yes, consultation sir. committee and by Monday, 
Naga Lakshmi will give the name of internal uh, uh, consultative committee, uh, advisory committee, and task force committee. And then we will decide also by Monday the suggestions from Naga Lakshmi who from outside we take the external advisory committee, external task force committee. In every country, we will nominate one or two or three persons, those who are bridge for us. Because Naga Lakshmi, you have made such a wonderful thing. I, I attend hundreds of seminars, but have I given so much attention to anybody? No, to yours. Thank yours. you so much, sir. I'm yeah. highly blessed. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much. The admission, this, a lot of people are, uh, uh, I've seen the, uh, how many people have got admission, what you are running. So uh, I would say that uh, my these people, if you have, uh, all those who have invited last minute, you can just uh, wait for a little while so that we hear. Uh, Jaya Prasad Ji is from Keral. If, if somebody asks me which is the most favorite, beloved, loving state for me, Keral, Keral, because they are religious people. And in Europe, I was the leader of all Keralites. They will not celebrate Oman without me or do the Durga Puja without me. And therefore, no, I am, I'm, I'm making a university in Keral. Uh, in Trivendram, I got already, in, uh, other places have already centers. So, sir, Provide Chancellor Saab, ab pehle bol li liye. Thank you, sir. Uh, Respected uh, Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, a great founder yeah. of Havinti Group of Institutions. Most uh, esteemed, most esteemed All other, please, unmute, unmute. All other, please, unmute. So, sir, mute. So, all okay. other, please, mute. Right. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, the great founder of Amiti Group of Institutions uh, uh, and the most esteemed uh, fellow uh, panelists, faculty members, uh, dear participants and uh, students. A very warm good evening. Amiti Institute of uh, International Studies have initiated an important subject with regard to South Asia. Last three days, a large number of issues have already discussed. I appreciate the Amity University for uh, such an initiative of re-imaging South Asia. I also thank the uh, Amity University for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, multilateralism got much relevance with the end of uh, Cold War. Also, uh, regional economic integration got more importance and vibrancy after the end of Cold War. Uh, thereafter, uh, meanwhile, the international terrorism became a, a major concern of the world community. Thus, war on terror changed the world politics. Unrest in West Asia, Arab Spring, American intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq, sanctions against Iran, the ISIS, uh, etc., etc., disturbed the spirit of multilateralism in the uh, f uh, first decade of the 21st century. Emergence of China, with uh, as an both as an economic power as well as a military power, and the U.S.-China economic conflict also added new crisis. Being the two largest countries, India. China conflict and the ongoing trust deficit will also add problems to the spirit of multilateralism. US-Russia differences also act as a threat to the multilateralism. The, the Brexit, the economic assertion of individual nations will also pose some problems in the road of multilateralism. Definitely in the post-COVID-19 world order, a new multilateral uh, narrative will come. Uh, coming to South Asia, South Asia had uh, such an important place because it consists of the largest democracy in the world and the region. Uh, at present, uh, it is the home of more than uh, 180 crore people. That is the 20 21% of the world population resides in the South Asia. That is the relevance of the uh, South Asian region. 
it is important that uh, this region had the same historical and civilizational base their cultural identity as well as the colonial subjugation had the same pattern at the uh, all the south asian countries entered into the present political process after the uh, second world war it was interesting that uh, the racial homogeneity and the civilizational link not much helped to develop multilateralism in this region the creation of pakistan not solved the problem instead it opened an era of antagonism since 1947 in this uh, south asia in 1970 it was divided and a new nation bangladesh emerged it had hostilities with uh, afghanistan and india from the very beginning all the multilateral engagements in south asia were failed or not performed as expected because of the pakistan attitude towards india afghanistan and bangladesh even 35 years of after the creation of sarc south asia failed to develop a strong regional forum maybe there are many other uh, reasons first of all the region consists of uh, unequal states at the same time our neighboring asean association of southeast asian nations performed well and remained as a vibrant multilateral forum because all the member nations cherish the same interest and uh, development concern bilateral politics never a burden to the asean grouping as far as the south asia is concerned mistrust and the internal politi political compulsions still dominate among member nations pakistan obstructionist attitude block the uh, uh, regional spirit hence in this region bilateralism is more successful than multilateralism limitations of multilateralism is very evident in the region for example inter regional trade fdi inter regional fdi is only 3% compared to asean's 25% uh, coming to the regional trade south asian regional trade is dismally low at 4% as compared with the regional trade of european union at 67% north american free trade agreement at 62% asean 26% the common market for eastern and southern africa at 22% even gcc at 8 8% etc in my view two actors disturbing multilateralism in south asia that is one the china and the another the pakistan since 1948 pakistan was obsessed with the kashmir and always uh, use kashmir against india in all its uh, multilateral engagements even in the 2020 un speech they referred uh, kashmir against india indo pak relations for the last 73 years were in the same pattern both the nations engaged with two open wars two limited wars uh, and all the, there is a pak based uh, terrorism in kashmir since 1989 Uh, providing sanctuary to terrorist groups by pakistan etc will definitely disturbing the south asian uh, peace uh, we should look at that aspect also while discussing multilateralism in south asia china factor uh, should be taken into account china worked through pakistan already china is working uh, uh, through pakistan in the region from the very beginning also chinese military and commercial facilities in pakistan sri lanka bangladesh maldives etc also act as a hurdle to the south asian uh, integration if we analyze the 35 years of sarc definitely we can say that it is ineffective it cannot move forward with the pakistan 19th sarc summit cancelled because of uh, uh, pakistan attitude hence india gave much importance to bimstec and also to act east policy in the current context multilateralism will not uh, work smoothly in south asia india may opt bilateral or trilateral engagements otherwise we should start 
to discuss a south asian multilateral forum without pakistan also we may add new nations like uh, myanmar uh, and uh, or thailand to the south asian uh, multilateral engagements only because of pakistan sarc became ineffective hence we should think about restructuring sarc and new multilateral engagement is a must i am confident that definitely in the post covid 19 world a new south asian multilateral order will come we may excel in vision action is important provide a working multilateral platform in south asia sarc is not functioning point out the reasons and come out uh, 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 with a remedy only because of the uh, 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 and uh, considering all this uh, uh, background uh, i think that uh, uh, this is the right movement to discuss uh, uh, that what is the basic problem of the south asia especially since 1985 sarc was there but uh, as already we discussed it is now not functioning but how we can uh, activate this uh, regional forum uh, and uh, what are the fundamental issues that should be discussed with these words i am uh, i am once again i thank the amity university for giving me this opportunity great namaste yeah, thank you very much very worthy of you uh, now again dr gurinder singh del gadiok rajiv sharma you tell me am i too obsessed from the idea to work in this area or uh, kalpana you want to say because you know i want to know i am so con convinced so impressed is it Dr. right is it is it not right from me because you have seen my obsession my passion so i i want to control and check if my obsession <clears throat> and passion is not on the wrong way who will tell me it is right or wrong because this is very important Sir, you can I can I say something? Yes, please, sir. I think this is a. Uh, uh, I think the vision of our founder has always been to do something extraordinary. And as I was saying in the beginning, a uh, long time back when Dr. Kalam had a vision to do something in Africa. and when the entire european union said that it is impossible when 18 institutions top institutions in india said that it is not possible it was our founder dr chohan who said that it is possible and it is because of his unparalleled vision that we were able to educate more than 80000 african students and when today he is talking about mit south asia thought and action forum he is very very clear that we need to achieve outcome we need to do something which is extraordinary and i think that uh, uh, at the national level we can do many things but at the education level at the as a university we can do many things uh, to contribute i was just looking at the, uh, the figures of unicef there are 627 million children who are looking for a world class education and i think this is a this is a, a this is a segment where we would like to contribute most and the vision of dr johan is that we should be able to give world class education to these 627 million students who are looking for afghanistan pakistan bangladesh sri lanka nepal bhutan maldives i think that these are the countries who can determine the shape of the education revolution and india can play a very very important role and uh, and today we try talking about atam nirbhar bharat <laughs> dr chohan is talking about atam nirbhar region so we can create a south asian region which is a atam nirbhar region world class incubator by providing the skill based Thank you. Uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Anil, sir, uh, Ambassador Anil Trikunath would like to speak something. Yes, yes. He right. said something. And good evening, uh, uh, Dr. Chauhan. Uh, right. It's so good to see you again. And yes, I have always admired your visionary <laughs> style and uh, uh, and the very focused approach on things. And I was really uh, amazed to see that out of this. conference you have really come out on the action oriented aspect 
allow me to compliment you and uh, your team for choosing the name south asian forum for thought and action <laughs> and that is safta now safta is one of the few institutions south asian free trade agreement right. within the sarc that has functioned very very smoothly since 1999 or 2006 so it is one of the organizations that has done amazingly well and i'm sure that it's not coincidental that you have chosen this name uh, a few thoughts firstly as you know that uh, if you want to work bilaterally with different countries it is possible to do so directly with each country as you have been doing in many countries and as uh, dr gurinder singh has said and general gadiok also has come out with all the seven or uh, eight points they are extremely important and they are all doable points and they must be uh, taken the lead in but i believe that uh, perhaps uh, i don't know you already have or not but you could have some kind of an incubator of ideas and intelligence as far as the artificial intelligence robotics and the requirement for engaging into or moving forward into the industrial revolution 4.0 research is extremely important and in which mit is doing superbly well people have talked about healthcare lead taking in the healthcare you have your medical organization and there one can help a lot but what is required now which the government is also trying to work out is once we have these vaccines which are need immediate requirement within a year or so then how the logistical supply chains are going to be worked out perhaps a study from you would be very useful for the ministry of external affairs or collaboration jointly with them dr singh spoke about atmanirbhar again their atmanirbhar concept is not the self reliance of the 1980s as the prime minister himself has said it means creating your own competitive edge but for everyone else so that we work be a part of the global value and supply chains so i guess that there also the government in my view is knows the vision but the implementation of it is where, where the amit could be of great help that is something i believe now tele education dr singh referred to recently the government has launched e vidya bharati and e arogya bharati missions which are the next step of the uh, pan african e network that was launched uh, under the vision of uh, dr kalam there at least i believe that if we have some good ideas we should be able to create a similar kind of thing in collaboration with the ministry of external affairs for the sarc countries all the ideas are already as uh, the uh, as ambassador shambhu spoke are there within the sarc sector so we need to open channels number one with the sarc sector sarc sector general directly in nepal number two with the ministry of external affairs with the uh, development partnership division and the sarc division in the ministry of external affairs so there are some specific steps that can take your vision uh, forward in the right direction because as you know that we have given billions of dollars to our neighbors some of it is utilized some is still pending and they are looking for ideas that can be really uh, taken forward and can be gelled into the reality and not remain as simple a line of credits for various kinds of things for example in nepal uh, in bangladesh i was posted there the rural telecommunication is such a big problem there in most of the countries so can we work on that together so that those are some of the areas i think because your university is focused uh, and has such a deep Uh, sense of uh, attachment and achievement uh, i would suggest these things thank you thank you mr anil thank you very much uh, lakshmi when i see so many worthy persons i yes, want sir. to honor few of them with honorary professorship actually yes. everybody deserves to be a honorary professor of your institute of international studies but i have a yes. limit of number so with the permission of chancellor and vice chancellor you please make a humble request that our offer of honorary professorship i will i have to limit it today to three only is accepted by professor harsh v pant is expected accepted by ambassador anil and is accepted by professor shambhu 
Shambhu Ramji. We will write to you, sir, and we will be honored at the moment. Actually, everybody deserves, but these three, so that a momentum is coming from that. When a, uh, this is hanging in your wall, you will always think, what should I do for Lakshmi? So we will do in a separate celebration online, bestowing this honor to Chancellor, Vice Chancellor. And today, I, uh, Lakshmi will write to you, and I need your continuous guidance. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Gwinder Singh has spoken. Uh, Dr. Ambassador Aram Sharma, Aram Agarwal, are you, are you on, online now? Ambassador Aram Agarwal, he was having problem. <coughs> Ambassador, <coughs> he's with me now since more than 10 years. He was ambassador in seven different countries. Extremely worthy person. So I think uh, now, Gurukhal Shukla, are you, are you on, uh, online? Yes, sir, I'm online, sir. Now you are a incorrigible person, unbelievable. I give you the job to pursue with Lakshmi that by Monday, I have the names of the internal consultative committee, sir. task force committee, and the proposed name for external advisory committee and external task force. It means advisory will be senior persons, a task sir. force, the young bride, those who are on the front line. Lakshmi sir. will do it, Lakshmi. He is a biting, <laughs> biting person. He will be now behind your life. One day I, and all these persons, those who have come on my 20 minutes notice, they will be in the inter, internal advisory committee. Uh, I welcome you also. You are here. Uh, Commander Sharma, you are here. Welcome you. Uh, sir, uh, with your... Hello. Uh, Am I audible? Yes. yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, sir, with I need kind permission uh, from uh, founder, sir. I want to announce uh, something uh, uh, very relevant to this. Uh, may I, sir? I need your permission. Okay, okay. For just a minute. Uh, sorry. Who is Dr. Uh, Shavesh and Dr. J uh, Jayadev and Priyanka? Uh, Dr. Shirish. Uh, Dr. Shirish Patak, please uh, switch on your webcam. Dr. Jayadev Paritha and Dr. Divya Anand. These are my team, uh, team, so the faculty. Is Priyanka with you also? No, Priyanka is a research scholar. Okay, great, great. Okay, so she now you, go ahead. you wanted to say something. Uh, uh, sir, just yes. for information, Admiral right. Kochak, just for information, right. Admiral R.M. Uh, Agarwal, he's having trouble with his. Uh, internet connection. I spoke to him when you asked for him. Right. I spoke to him. He's got internet connection problems. And therefore, right. he's not able to join, sir. Great, no problem. And Pocher, how far is the ship, ship journey to Maldives? From the, Maldives, sir, uh, it'll not take long time. It may be just about depending on the what speed. But about uh, two, three days, uh, we should be there, sir. Maldives is one of our country will be taking. Okay. Actually, go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. So I just want to announce uh, with the blessings of, of course, the founder president, sir, with the great inspiration of our chancellor, sir, I, whenever I hear him, I get uh, another new, uh, you know, uh, uh, a layer of inspiration. And of course, uh, uh, the, the great motivation of our beloved honorable, uh, honorable uh, VC ma'am, and of course, support of uh, with our dean ma'am, we realize that how important in person and virtual gathering are for our international stream and we are excited to announce i on behalf of my entire team of aiis in which all my worthy students also join me in revealing that vgk issue will be a signatory event of aiis and the same will be organized under different theme related to international relations every year during the same time so most of all we are all happy uh, to be able to support a good work all of you are doing around the world and please share any feedback with us by my email is there with you all and as there is always a room for you know improvement and excel so i i just wanted to announce that vtk issue will be a signatory event of aiis with your blessing sir i i am i'm i'm more than sure so that i what does issue means because i i could what does vtk issue means uh, sir, Vijigeshu means, I think Dr. Uh, Shirish Patek will explain. I want uh, you to listen from him. Dr. Shirish, uh, will you please explain uh, Vijigeshu? 
So, ma'am, uh, Vijugishu is the concept primarily given by Chanakya in his uh, most famous treatise, this Arthashastra. So, Vijugishu means literal meaning of Vijugishu is the, the, the state who wants to win, who is having that willingness to win. So, in the world of anarchic world systems, so almost each and every state is aspiring to, to win their, their respective industrial interests. That's why, uh, that's why we, have, uh, we have taken this, uh, our uh, oriental source of the term, and we have taken this term to make our signature event, Vijugishu. Dr. Devinder. Mr. Devinder, please print it from the website, the exact meaning. And so may, I, uh, may I submit something? Yeah, bolo. Yes, sir. Yeah. sir, Vijigishu also means to surpass, to overcome obstacles and go for yes. victory. Yes, <laughs> yes, true, true, true. Okay, that's yes. good. Great. Yes. So, actually, my best wish yes. to you all. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Yes. One of the best in the country and her all are with Thank you. you. They are very Thank worthy people to whom you are invited. Astonishingly worthy and capable and experienced. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jaydev and Dr. Devya. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So he's Dr. Jaydev. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's our honor to have you. Great. Great. Uh, Dr. Divya. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. It's my honor to have you here and have such a vast knowledge to listen firsthand information, to gather so much from you. You are truly a big time inspiration, not only for me, in fact, for all Amityans and those who are yes. listening to you at this point. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, with your permission, uh, hello. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Nagashri, please go ahead. Yes, yeah. So, with your permission, uh, can we uh, ask for a vote of thanks? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Jaydev, please go ahead with the vote of thanks. Formal vote of thanks. Uh, now, I'd like to request our convener, Dr. Sridhar Kumar Pathak, to give the formal vote of thanks. So, before that, I'd like to thank the panelists. All the panelists, they have drawn their experience, knowledge, and, uh, and their uh, passion to South Asia and how to reimagine this particular institution and to build and look at the future growth and the future of South Asia as a region and South Asia as a hub of world diplomacy and engagement. With this, I would like to invite Dr. Patrick to carry out, to give the formal vote of thanks and yes. include uh, Vijigisu 2020 and give some highlights for Vijigisu 2021. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zayadev. Uh, very grateful to you. Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, I must uh, um, convey my sincere gratitude to Honorable Founder President, sir. Uh, we are really thrilled, sir, uh, to have you here. Uh, I can't True. say I don't find any proper words to. Uh, express it actually. Uh, so please uh, uh, forgive me for that. And also, I want to uh, uh, express my gratitude to Honorable Chancellor Sir, Honorable Vice Ch Group Vice Chancellor Sir, Gurinder Sir, uh, Professor Gurinder Sir. Uh, really, you are an inspiration, and we have learned a lot from you, Sir. Um, I want to express my sincere gratitude to uh, to, uh, to to all the uh, key uh, all the guest guest speakers who have participated in this three days uh, uh, convention, and I must start with the from inaugural season, and that inaugural season was started by our chief guest, Honorable uh, Sri Professor Sri Prakash Mitra Party Vice Chancellor Indira Gandhi National Amar Kantak University. Uh, it is followed by our keynote sp speaker, Professor S.D. Muni, sir, Emeritus Professor from JNU. Um, because we are running out of time, so I'm not being able to summarize the things. So, but I'm just I'm trying to uh, take the names of the all dignitaries so that we can must uh, complete our session in time, well in time. Um, in that uh, the same uh, inaugural session, uh, we 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 were fortunate to have Ambassador um, Vishnu Prakash, sir. I must uh, um, I I'm really conveying you regards from the, on behalf of my, uh, of AIS and Amity University to you, sir. Um, then I uh, must uh, 
uh, uh, take the names of the, all the chairs uh, uh, who have participated in different session of Vidu Vishu 2020. I will start from uh, Professor Tej Bahadur Singh, uh, Professor of Banaras Hindu University, uh, then Professor Sanjay Bharadwaj, Professor from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, then uh, Professor Subinder Singh Bindra uh, from our own AIIS, then Professor uh, uh, Dr. Irina Pop, Director CDSRS United Kingdom. Uh, then we had Professor Amit Kumar Upadhyay uh, from Gorakhpur University. Then we have Dr. Sita Khan Mishra from Deen Dayal Upadhyay, Petroleum University Associate Professor, uh, Gujarat. Then we have Dr. Dhananjay Tripathi, Senior Lecturer from South Asian University, uh, Delhi. Uh, then we have, we have uh, Dr. Santesh Kumar Singh, Associate Professor, Haryana Center University. In one of the chair, we, uh, today we had uh, Dr. Raymond Lau, Hong Kong Baptist University, Hong Kong. Uh, now, and now, uh, today at validity session, yes, of course, we, we are so fortunate to have uh, Professor Harsvi Pant. We have heard him uh, at today. All people have heard him. And really, really, I, I, uh, I want to convey my regards on behalf of my Amity Institute of International Studies as well and Amity University. Um, in the same session, we, are, uh, we had Professor Swan Singh. Uh, sir, uh, always uh, it's a really pleasure to listen from you because we are the students of you and we have learned a lot from you. So I convey sincere regards to you, you too, sir. In the same military session, we have a uh, opportunity to listen uh, from uh, Mr. Anil Tegunath, sir. Uh, uh, he, he was very seasoned diplomat and uh, he led several missions to uh, several countries uh, representing India. So um, I, I really, really thankful to you, sir. Uh, then I must uh, uh, offer my sincere regards to Ambassador Professor Dr. Shambhu Ram Simkhada. Uh, sir, uh, yes, of course, uh, with your presence, we have, uh, we have felt enlightened here. And the way you have uh, exchanges world of wisdom with our honorable president, uh, our founder president, sir, it's actually, it's a thought provoking and it definitely, it will guide us to the, to the, to the floor. Um, in the same vein, I need to, uh, I need, uh, I, I also want to convey my regards to my Dean Ma'am, Professor uh, V. Yoga Joshna Ma'am, uh, and uh, our HOI Director, uh, Professor Dr. Nagalakshmi M. Raman Ma'am, uh, for continuous provocation and to do something different. So it's, it's all about uh, because of your leadership, Ma'am. Um, in the same uh, breath, I need to, uh, I, I, uh, I want to express my sincere gratitude to uh, the guardians of MIT University, my senior uh, colleagues. Uh, they, they, they always come on, on the path and they always uh, play the role of pioneer. So I'm very grateful to them also. Um, then I need to uh, convey my sincere regards to the colla our collaborator uh, from NIIC, uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal. I'm very grateful to you. Uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, in the from the beginning, the idea which we have in the form of Vijay Vishu, he he supported that idea, and through long the whole uh, sessions, he was a great uh, uh, strength for us. So I sincerely thankful to you uh, for for NIIC, NIIC Nepal. So I'm very thankful to you, Pramod Jaiswal ji. Uh, and in the same way, I need to say words for Mr. Ankit Bhatia, our next collaborator, or the other collaborator from Mulya Foundation, Director Mulya Foundation. So I'm very grateful to you both. Now I must take opportunity to uh, convey my regards to all the paper presenters, because uh, if it is an international conference and we're not having a, a plenty of papers, so there's no meaning to have an international conference on world politics. And I'm really glad to, uh, to, to share this information that from, uh, from more than 16 countries, we have received, received more than 40 abstract. And out of 40 abstract, we have selected 31, uh, of course, 32 uh, papers we have selected. And that is actually uh, covered almost all South Asian countries. So I must say that you made the three days international conference not only truly international, but also very qualitative and thought provoking. So I must, uh, I'm very grateful to you all, actually. Uh, with the same, uh, with the same uh, deal, I need to share that uh, I must uh, um, convey my sincere regards to all the research scholars coming from different universities who have participated uh, as an observer or as in a participant in our convention, and research scholar from Amity University and AIS as well. 
Uh, yes, students are very special. Uh, almost all five batches of AIS always they were uh, very much present in the, all the sessions. They have put lots of questions to our presenters and uh, chairs and guests. So that makes the whole convention is really truly meaningful. Um, I, I cannot forget to take the names of the volunteers team um, and uh, and Dr. Jadeev sir has given me distinct list that I must not forget to take name and I'm just uh, just I will take one or two minutes and I want to take the names of our students who have supported us in, in all the way possible. Anchors, uh, Pakhi, Gaba, uh, Isha, Sahil, Karthik, Urvashi, Vasundhara, Aleen, Khyati, Lakshmi. Uh, we had the system of reporters so that we can have real time uh, update on the FB pages. There are uh, more than 13 or 14 FB pages we have broadcasted live for this convention. So from reporters, Ritika, Kratika, Sherab, uh, Mayuri, Prajapta, Rohit, Rafi, Sukriti, Mahima, Sayukta, Parth, Brinda, Smriti, Elenla, Aditya, Kush, Kushbu, Haridas, and Priska. Uh, from social media team, uh, Sumit, Priska, Asoman, Daniel, Tom, and Rohit. And uh, for this e-conference, we have uh, finally we had more than 21 posters from the each and every session and the overall uh, overall um, convention. And all the 21 posters uh, was uh, was uh, prepared by Gargi Sharma and Sumit Yadav. So, so I'm very, very grateful to Gargi and Sumit. So they're not by training, they're they are not designer, but still they have come out with a very impressive sort of set of posters. So I'm very thankful to all of you. Uh, and then in the last, I need to, uh, I am very grateful to my staff, uh, Rupa, uh, Rupa Shri ma'am and Sachin and Devaya. And again, I if uh, I need to say that uh, that uh, I need to uh, I must pray to Almighty that He has made this particular vision uh, fulfilled and translated uh, the way it it is being translated in the, in our department. Yes, of course, we have started a conversation that we need to convene an international conference for three days, and that must be a name of education. But at that moment, we are not aware that we can come to at this level. So it's, of course, it's a blessings of Almighty. So uh, with this sentence, with this uh, remark, I give my uh, vote of thanks. But I'm inviting you all that we, are, as our HOI ma'am has announced that uh, video issue is going to be our signatory event. So I'm inviting uh, right now that please, please join us on the same time for video issue 2021 so that we can make this event more uh, truly meaningful and very much, uh, uh, very much worthy so that we can contribute to our society, nation and reason. Uh, and to the make most of it. So I'm very thankful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.